Right, what's going on? Uh, what's up, Joe Biden? Love to see the president in, in my chat, dude. It means it means a lot. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes you give someone your vote and then there they go. But you never see them in your chat again. But for Sleepy Joe to come around here, <sighs> drop some low dub, some chicken walks in chat, it means a lot. It's big. It's a big deal. Oh, wait. Uh, turn this down a little bit. Turn this down a little bit. No, no, no. There it goes. Uh, no. <laughs> Joe Biden and George Soros are a dynamic duo. Yes, I do think that the core of my chat is Joe Biden and George Soros. Isn't he? Did, wait, didn't he die? Am I totally out of the loop? I thought I heard George Soros died. Am I dead wrong? <laughs> no, Biden. I didn't say Biden. <laughs> Uh, it's me walking. This is crazy. Oh yeah. So if you guys don't know why I'm live, it's because we've had the first successful labor movement in this country's history. Pre chatter spammed chicken walk until I went live. I was not going to go live, <laughs> but the power of the movement did it. They won. <laughs> it's crazy. But as, as the capitalist, I was unable to, uh, to create my large profits without their, the power of their chicken walks. <laughs> and like, could this be a moment that sweeps the nation? Am I crazy? But could this be a moment that begins a larger, broader labor movement? Puts power back in the hands of the workers? No, of course not. <laughs> it's just Twitch chat. But still, still it's one. We're seizing the means of content production. We're not really doing that, right? You're just spamming chicken walk. <laughs> just to be clear. I mean, I want to like just hone in on what you're exactly doing, which is what, which is using the word chicken walk over and over. Um, fuck the workers, Elon on top. Interesting. So there's two sides to this story. Some people are pro worker. Some people want Elon Musk to win more than he already has. They want the world's richest man to make more money, which is a good, interesting idea. Looking into this, <laughs> concerning, interesting. Um, started playing Sifu because of you. The combat is so fun. Uh, I, I, you know, I w it was fun, but I just I played so little that I don't even know yet. Um, I feel like I just all I did was um, Instagram ad you, where I played the game and I died a bunch, and so you're like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll show this ad how it's done. And then you bought Sifu. Because I, I really didn't do much. I mean, I fucking hit master difficulty and died to the first boss. Mm. Uh, I'll bet workers' tears taste even better on Mars. I, I assume they're the same everywhere. I assume workers' tears, if you're into that, <laughs> are consistent across planetary. I think it's something you could bottle and serve across the galaxy. Uh, Big A, when are you playing Batman game again? Why the fuck would you think I would ever play that Batman game again? Why did I even play it the first time? Po Baba, thank you for the three gifties. To Rolo, Sevis, and Lewis, uh, respectively. Thank you. Welcome all to the, the sub subs. <laughs> My language is fluid today. Uh, why do you hate CST and EST frogs? Um, so a long time ago, I used to have an uncle. And his name was Jesus Christ. And an EST frog by the name of Judas actually betrayed him um, and cost him his life, really. Luckily, he had a friend in high places, so it worked out. But um, ever since that day, I, I haven't trusted EST frogs. You know what I'm saying? And so I kind of spurned them with my lifetimes. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I do it. And then CST frogs are kind of like, um, you know, people in the middle of a war zone. They're collateral damage. I, I really mean no ill will to CST frogs. I just, they get, I'm trying to kill the EST frogs and they get caught in the way. Um, is it because Jeff Bezos isn't an EST frog? Jeff Bezos is currently living a life where he flies around the world taking human growth hormone and taking pictures with his 
uh, ex reporter wife. <laughs> That's what I use. He has, you know what? Jeff Bezos is doing everything that Elon Musk should have done with his billions <laughs> instead of mauled on Twitter all day. Uh, Jeff Bezos is living the fucking dream. Uh, it's unfortunate that he's fucking accumulated a dragon's hoard of wealth, but uh, at least he's not wasting it. Hey, Big A, have you seen Hatsune Miko perform at a wedding? Yeah, she performed at my wedding. Uh, I During the ceremony, I paused and I told Ari I have a surprise. <laughs> and then I we, we wheeled out a big monitor on stage and then Hatsune Miko performed. For 45 minutes, I believe. Um, and all the guests were shocked, I will tell you that. But I think they learned something about great art. Uh, Big A, you really got to watch Succession. It gets really, really good if you stick with it. <laughs> so does heroin, right? But <laughs> there's the problem is there's not a lot of benefit to me. Um, I just, I don't think... You know, I, I'm sure I would like it. That's not the problem. The problem is I'm trying to um, carefully and accurately focus my time and energy onto a few key things that I want to push forward. They're like boulders that I got to move up a big hill. And succession would get in the, would put wheels in the boulder. Heroin gets worse with more use, not better. Okay, junkie. <laughs> Okay, ease up, bro. Okay, fuck. Uh, I was going to have... We're going to do a chat heroin party, but now that you've ruined the vibe, we'll do something else. Um. <laughs> Dr. Battle, how's it going? Just... Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Just got a check from the state for $26... Because TurboTax charged me for tax prep services that should have been free. Get that bread, King! Holy fuck, fight back! Uh, fuck TurboTax on God. And their fucking insane lobby to make taxes complicated, hard, and uh, not auto-filed. LMAO TurboTax sweating right now. Yeah, the, the accountant at TurboTax is like, what the <laughs> we're 26 short. It's all red ink. Have you heard of this puzzle game called Viewfinder coming out next month? If this is an indie game that you're involved with, <laughs> go off, King. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, Viewfinder. What? <laughs> this is a game where you can walk into tweets? That sounds like hell. <laughs> I don't want to live in Twitter, bro. That sounds like fucking misery on earth. Concerning. Elon Musk's wet dream. Whoa, do you guys notice that chat is going above the camera as well? It's almost like you guys are surrounding me. I'm getting a little bit claustrophobic. The chat needs to always be right here. Oh, I just moved it up. But also people got to read it. Like right there is good. Get him. <laughs> Atriox trapped. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Get fucked. <laughs> What is this? Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. I can already tell I'm going to solve all these puzzles first try and chat's going to be like extremely impressed. <laughs> I can already tell this is going to be a breeze. I will zoom through it at a eagle's pace. Yeah, I'll play this. Why not? She looks fun. She looks gas. Looks kind of like, uh, you know, it's got witness vibes. It's got a uh, looker vibes. Oh boy. I can definitely tell I will not mauled at any one of these puzzles <laughs> for hours on end. 
I can just tell it's not going to be a problem for me. So... Oh, interesting. Well, that looks fun. Uh, absolutely, I'll check that out. Super, li oh, super liminal, dude. What a good, what a fun little game that was. Uh, Ishi TP, I want to thank you for your 17 months of support and for your message. Hey, Glorandon. It really meant a lot to me. To receive that message from you, it's just like, that's what this community, this connection's about. Uh, Thunder Lemon, thank you for the Prime. 25 months. Your boy Gutshot, thank you for the Prime. Jolson for the 16. Lincoln Log with the 7. Bobacon with the 13. So oifed, thank you for the 5 months. Elon Musk looks like a mole man from under the Earth's crust. Uh... <laughs> I I am not the world's biggest Elon fan. I'm not sure that he looks like a mole man. But I'm going to find out right now. Elon Musk as a mole man from under the Earth's crust. Let's see if uh let's see if we can make that happen. Uh <laughs> generating uh Dolly. Um what games are you planning to play next? Great question. I was planning to play ga mind games with you by not revealing the next games I play. <laughs> by being coy with it, you know? And then also shifting around. No, I, I, what I want to play is... There's this indie game called Hitman or something. I was thinking of getting it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, next games I want to play. Humanity. I want to play Humanity. I want to play more Sifu. Uh... Hopefully that Silk Song thing comes out pretty soon. No, that's the, the Hollow Knight expansion. That comes out in two weeks. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you guys want to congratulate your boy. I don't know if you guys want to fucking dap me up. Crazy that I get no fucking credit, even though I'm sure you've heard about it. I went 3-0 yesterday at the Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering pre-release. First place. Best in the shop. Got a bunch of free packs. Cracked, racked, and stacked, baby. Uh, oh, detective game. Yeah, good memory on that. Ask. And you got the one ring? Yeah, and I got the one ring. So things... <laughs> yeah, I forgot that I got the one ring. Uh, wow, that was $2 million in my pocket. I didn't even think about it. Crazy. When you got bread like this, it doesn't even fucking matter to you. Uh, crazy thing to forget. I know. I guess for most people, you'd forget it, but you wouldn't forget it. Uh, what was your deck? I'll tell you what my deck was. Well, it's not gonna. You guys are gonna nerge me. Or you're gonna back and bat chest me because you don't. Nobody cares because you don't know magic. <laughs> but it's cool. I'm just gonna show you the fucking two card combo. It's cool. All right. Just but before you even respond to it, just know that it's cool. That what I'm saying. Okay. I got these two cards. Uh. No, don't say glup shitto. Don't say. <laughs> All right, I got these Mirkwood bats that whenever you create a token, each opponent loses one life. Interesting. Very interesting. And then I got the Horn of Gondor that creates a lot of tokens. Perhaps you could see the synergies. <laughs> so you create the tokens and they drain their life and you just do 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 do. Why the fuck is the bat at common? I don't know. That's why I snatched them up. It's cool, Chad. <laughs> Guys, this is fucking cool what I'm telling you. If fucking Snoop Dogg were doing it, you'd, get, you'd be pogging right now. And he probably would because he thinks it's cool. Okay, how about this? I'll tell you what's cool. Remember that idea of Elon Musk as a mole man emerging from the Earth's crust? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this? <laughs> now that's cool. <laughs> Holy shit. This is a real photo. I went to documentary.com. Dude, was, I remember I had this friend. I'm just going to say his name. I don't give a shit. His name was Curtis. When I was in like sixth sixth grade. Yeah. No, ninth grade. Sorry. It was like freshman year of high school. 
And this kid, Curtis, would um, tell me lies <laughs> all the time <laughs> about uh, things he heard in comedy specials, but that were true. Uh, so, for example, the one I remember most was there was like a Ron White. He's this old comedian, part of like Jeff Foxworthy, <laughs> you know, like the redneck crew. And uh, no. And, and so Ron White had a joke about like, I don't know, some environmentalist getting hit by a tree during a hurricane. It was a pretty poor taste joke, to be honest. <laughs> Curtis would tell me that story like it was real, like he saw it on the news. And then I was like, wow, what the fuck? What, how did you see that? Where can, I, where can I see this happening? And then he's like, he would just tell me. It was like, oh, yeah, you could find it on um, like NBC.com or something. <laughs> and I'm like, Curtis, I know your dumb ass is not going home and watching NBC.com for the news. So stop fucking lying to me. Uh, but that's what he would do. And, and, but I, I legitimately, the first time he did it, believed him and I tried to look it up and there was nothing. And then I saw a fucking Ron White special like six months later on Comedy Central at like 1 a.m. And it was exactly what he told me. And I got pissed. The fifties were so crazy. They, were, they sure were. They sure were. Uh, I was not in ninth grade in the fifties. Okay. I got held back a lot. So I was still in fourth grade in the fifties, but um, goaded vid, my boy. We're not watching vids just yet. We don't got a we got a rush into the vids. You know what I'm saying? Usual trash. Thank you for the prime. Icon Willie. Thank you for the prime. Twenty nine months took that long for the hair to go. I see the hair is not gone. The hair is not gone. The hair is growing. Guys, pretty soon you're gonna be like Brandon. Please cut your hair. It's too flowing. It's too long. <laughs> it's it getting in the way of your eyes, and you can't see our primes. Uh. Oh, figure eight. What was your message? You said, no, you didn't. You didn't sub, bro. You just ran a message. Uh, J. Ray, may they have been 32 months. 32 months. Good goddamn. J. Ray, may your last message was simple. It was the fact that Isaiah still plays Super or Smash 64 and plays so well is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I guess. That, I mean, yeah, that's so true. It's not related to anything. But it is true. Um, H-Rock, how is serving in the Vietnam War? Because you are old. I can't. Let's assume for a second that I am a Vietnam War veteran. <laughs> is that is that what you would do? Like, if you were going down the street and you saw a really old man who had served in the Vietnam War, you would say, how is serving it? Because you're so old. And then you start laughing that you, you couldn't breathe. Like, what... How is that a how is that a respectful way to treat somebody who fought for your country? That doesn't that doesn't I would ask what crimes they committed. Well, I fought for Vietnam. <laughs> so first of all, check your privilege. Okay. I fought for the Vietnamese. Uh Hey, Shrek, how was the change? No, stupid question. And also, yeah, then I'd give the veteran a titty twister and run away. Drop Spindle. <laughs> Drop Spindle, you would not do that. Do not pretend. Do not try to pander to the chat and imply that if you were to see an old war veteran, you would call them old, give them a titty twister, then run away. You would not do that, Drop Spindle. I don't believe that you are that kind of person. That is an extremely, that would be mean. It would be mean spirit. It would be, it would be assault downright. This is an old person who can't defend themselves. Uh, and I don't think you would do that. All right. So let's not, let's not act cool in front of our friends here. Um, did XQC essentially pull 51 ring cards? <laughs> Bro, you do not need a metaphor for $100 million. Do you know what I'm saying? Essentially, he did not do that. No, that's a stupid way to think about it. By the way, if there was 51 rings, they wouldn't be worth $2 million a pop. So no, it's a stupid way to think about it. <laughs> so stupid. 
XQC, uh, he got $100 million. But if you can't understand that, let me explain it to you. He essentially found 100 NFTs worth a million dollars each, if that makes sense to you. Does that, does that understand? Like, wait, uh, <laughs> stop fucking... Mm. Uh, how many Elvish... How many teeth is that in Tooth Fairy terms? Yikes. XUC in Tooth Fairy terms definitely overwhelmed the pillow. <laughs> if I had to fucking put a label on it. Uh, unless they're big chonker teeth that you get more money for. Yeah, I wonder if to a Tooth Fairy, teeth scale up like diamonds. Or you don't need a quantity, you need quality. Like one rotten fucking, you know, cavity filled tooth is probably not worth a full quarter, but like a real shiny, big chonker rhinoceros tooth polished to a stone. It's 500 grand. <laughs> yeah. That's why I don't brush my teeth to ruin the tooth economy. I don't think you understand how the economy works. You're just ruining your own teeth and your own personal economy. <laughs> That's like saying I don't work. I, you know, I don't get a job to ruin the economy. You just you're just poor. <laughs> it doesn't you're not you're not taking on anyone. Um and you're not shorting the tooth market. <laughs> uh is he talking about his reverse tooth fairy business again? I for, I I remember that I had that discussion. I don't remember exactly what it was. I do remember that I pitched the idea of a reverse tooth fairy. I can't, I can, I know it was a good idea. I know everyone agreed with me, but I don't remember exactly what the idea was. I, I have good ideas all the time. I have good ideas literally all the time. I can, I can drop million dollar ideas any second, anytime you ask. But obviously, uh, <laughs> uh, now easy, easy. Okay, easy. How about um, an off Broadway musical about soldiers? in the war of 1812. <laughs> Perfect. That's there, a million dollar idea. Fucking easy. Just someone make it. Just write it. There, I'll, I'll get... <laughs> okay, wait. I, it's fucking easy. It's kind of like for Hamilton fans if you want more. Uh... Off Broadway musical about the War of 1812. About soldiers in the War of 1812. <laughs> there, I fucking uh, crank one out in chat GPT right now. Uh huh. In the year of 12, 1800, we took a stand never to be plundered, stood our ground. <laughs> there, look at this. We are the soldiers of 1812, marching to the drums' relentless tell. On hallowed ground where heroes fell, we weave our story that the world retell. Beneath the stars and stripes, our hearts do swell. No, I think you should play it from the British side. It'd be funnier. <laughs> anyway, this is great. This is easy money. I, and I, I'm just, I'm just farting these out, dude. I'm, I'm making you guys cash as we speak. I'll give you another one. Here's an idea. Um. How about like a fucking, uh, like a phone app, a phone app that when you use it, it tells you your greatest It, oh, it tells you, it tells you your oldest friend. Mm-hmm. And then you can click a button and it'll send them a uh, respectful emoji. <laughs> ah, it's cool. It's easy money. No, not a coffin. That would not be, that would not be inappropriate. Uh, what if we made an app that brings back Facebook poking? Interesting. 
congrats, you just invented Time Hop. Is Time Hop an app? Time Hop app. Time Hop. Celebrate your best memories today. About. What the fuck is this? At Sincere, we build products that have heart. Our family of brands has one thing in common. Technology that brings you closer and helps show you care to the people that matter the most. <laughs> I've been with the team for over a decade, and I'm not alone. I joined the company 11 years ago. I joined the company 15 years ago. We want this to be the best job you ever have. I've been with the company for over 14 years. If you ask anyone what they love most about working here, the answer is always the same. People. The people. The people. And we get to do some pretty cool stuff, too. Will you what? please welcome <laughs> Bare Naked Ladies. <laughs> Give it up! I wake up every day Holy and I shit, build something that matters to people. We always ask the question, what's the next best thing we can create? We think about our financial and strategic plan five to ten years down the road. <laughs> One of the best things about this company is that we put people first. Community service is important to our team. We donate to important causes. What's great about our company is the way the products work together. Uh, nothing more family than a family of brands. I hate my real family compared to my family of brands. You know what I'm saying? Our family of brands is connected by one thing, heart. We are a company, a team, a foundation, a family of brands. <laughs> we are sincere. <laughs> wow, I never would have gotten to that. Thank you for mentioning Time Hop. I don't think I invented that. I think they've invented their own thing. Um, bro, what do they do? They didn't mention that and they don't need to because they're sincere. They're a family of brands. It's not fake. It's a real fucking company. You can apply to a job there right now. Here, let's 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 see what jobs are open. You guys are looking. Uh, is anyone here an Android developer, or perhaps a senior Ruby on Rails developer? All of you, I think. How about somebody does executive assistant to the C-suite? Uh. You have to live within 20 minutes of Farmingham, Massachusetts. Framingham. That is a that is going to be a problem. Um, you like kids and are comfortable with pets. You <laughs> Bro, it's like a babysitter slash nanny. This is not an executive assistant. This is like you're comfortable picking up fucking dry cleaning and you're what the hell? You don't offend easily. That's also what it says. <laughs> you have raw intelligence. You can keep a secret. <laughs> what the fuck? It's not all about work, you know. Uh, whoa. You can work from home and our office and our CEO's house wherever you're needed. 24-7 mindset. <laughs> You'll work reasonable hours, but you have a 24-7 mindset. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? If I'm thinking about it 24-7, then it's not quite reasonable hours, is it? Jesus Christ. The family of brands is sounding more and more like a sex cult every second. Yeah, no joke intriguing somebody get this job and find out more learn more uh, somebody moved to farthingham massachusetts all right goodbye dr battle uh weird way of saying you'll always be on call yeah well yeah that is what they're saying um sounds like a job for evan gao i think evan gao would not be so good at this job <sighs> i can't keep a secret wow uh i have truly Helped you guys out. I got you guys job opportunities. I gave you $2 million ideas. Um, and we barely just started. It's crazy. I'm, I'm putting in overtime for you. I don't get thank ounce of thanks. Uh, H. Shriot, can you please, for the love of God, watch this Geometry Josh level? I'm about to die. This is my last message. <laughs> You're about to die. And this is your last message. And I have to watch this Geometry Josh level. All right.
Oh, I'm not getting it! Wait, I just gotta pretend I'm playing in case anyone joins the stream right now. Chat! Holy fuck, this is the run! Wait, I'm actually... Let me focus, 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 focus. Ah! Wait! I gotta get this next part! This is the hard part, I always fail here. Mm hmm Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Down, down, up, down, 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 up, down, 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 up, down. Okay. Last part. Okay. Holy fuck. Could this actually... Wait, wait, wait. Could this actually be the run? Come on. Mm-hmm. Easy part, easy part. And then... Okay. Okay. Let's go! Oh. <laughs> Let's go, not done yet. Oh, almost popped off too early. <laughs> Otto! Don't distract me, Otto. I'm fucking about to crush this level. I've been practicing, I've been grinding offline. Okay. This is the part I usually fuck up, but I think I can get it this time. I'm reading chat while I do it. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is eight minutes long. <laughs> this shit's eight minutes long, bro. I'm <laughs> fucking tired of it. I just realized, I was like, wait a minute, this is gonna go for a fucking ever. I can't keep this fucking bit up. Holy fuck, dude, no way. We weren't even close. We weren't even close. John Jammers, thank you for the six months. Six months of Atrock ignoring my sub and Enron jokes. Let's read a classic John Jammers Enron joke. I'm scrolling up. At Atrioc, favorite Enron board member? Stupid. Uh, scrolling up more. Is there more? Jeffrey Skilling, by the way. Jeff Skilling is my favorite Enron board member. Uh, scrolling up some more. I don't see a lot of other Enron jokes. You have a lot of jokes about <laughs> uh, my bald head. <laughs> you have jokes about how I should run Japan. I don't know what that means. Uh, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, don't comedy god him. He didn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve it. You don't don't give out comedy god like that. It's a fucking hard earned title. Uh SNL hire this man? No, they are Jake Novak's got the spot if he wants it. Big A, I'm confused. Your title doesn't say Columbo Knight. Can you fix this, please? I actually can't because the CEO of Twitch contacted me and said Columbo is banned. Single-handedly, single, single -handedly, Columbo's been banned from Twitch. Fucking crazy. I'm going to kick, baby. Second I get that kick contract, we're doing full-on Columbo Knights. Uh, Take off that hat and show your old man hairline, you coward. And that was your first chat message. <laughs> you followed for two months to make that message. I have to ban you. <laughs> VIP that man. Giga Chad based. Uh, Quacks alt deleted. Um, did you ever, does the Twitch stuff mean you finally get the 70, 30 sub split? Yes, actually for the first hundred K, right? Uh, I heard today that only like, like the number of people that actually are impacted by the Twitch sub change is like a thousand people out of millions. And I think I'm one of them, <laughs> which is, uh, 
hype, I guess. It's like only good for me. <laughs> it doesn't really help big streamers because it's a small point of their income. It doesn't help small streamers because they usually need 350 raw tier ones. It only helps like lower mid to middle class streamers, which is where I'm fucking thriving, bro. So I actually got like a pretty nice income boost. Uh, three fifty Warrington ones is a pretty big bird. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive bird. They should they should have made it. Listen, there's two things they should have done. One is seventy thirty for all subs, no matter what. But number two, at the very least, if they're going to be smart about it, if they're going to be a business, they're going to be ruthless. They should have done seventy thirty for raw tier ones up to the first hundred k uh, dollars. And that way, they still get to milk the top streamers who have all of the subs. And they can't really get a popular movement going because all the small streamers will be happy. So they won't like get, uh, they won't join the cause. That's what the smart business move would be. Right now, what they're doing is like helping almost nobody and making it kind of confusing and getting everyone kind of angry. Twitch has, Twitch has made a lot of unforced errors. Twitch should stop being a business and start being a family of brands. <laughs> yes. Yes, dude. I went, it used to be. It felt like it used to be a family of brands. And now it's just a business, dude. But the world doesn't tax the rich. The world does tax the rich. It doesn't tax the wealthy. <laughs> and there is a difference. And one day you'll learn the difference. Uh... <laughs> But the rich do get taxed. The athletes, Wesley Snipes, the actors, rappers, they get taxed, dude. Uh, Chris Rock joke, the rapper is rich. The guy who signs his check is wealthy. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Um... Hrock, in your opinion, do you think that Twitch losing money really affects Amazon at all? Yes, it's it's a pimple on Amazon's ass. <laughs> and if it's a big enough, annoying, painful pimple, you want to get rid of it. You know, you want to fix that. <laughs> but Amazon is, it's too big for the money to matter. But it's also like Amazon is not trying to run a charity here. <laughs> and they've been pressuring Twitch to be profitable for a long time. Um... Twitch is done if Amazon decides to scratch. Oh, <laughs> scratch the pimple. <laughs> Primes are a massive money sink. Massive is debatable. Um, Amazon Prime is massive as it is. I think the one thing that is become apparent though is that nobody is buying or keeping Amazon Prime because of the free Prime on Twitch. <laughs> Like that, that it has changed the sales of Prime at 0%. So it didn't do what the fuck the point was. Is it true that Kick used Amazon owned servers? Yes, they did. They use AWS, Amazon Web Services, to stream. So, so Kick does pay Amazon for every live stream, I mean, for, for, for streaming the bandwidth. Everyone uses AWS though? Well, yeah, it's, it's Azure from Microsoft or is AWS from Amazon? Um, but saying everything uses it is not a counter argument. <laughs> yeah, okay, their money goes to Amazon, their direct competitor, but like, so does everyone else. Amazon's really strong. Uh, doesn't that's not that that's that proves the point. Hey guys, it's your average Microsoft employee. Please use Azure. Uh, Azure's doing well, dude. They're both growing insanely. It's it's absurd. It's absurd. They should be separate companies. Uh, how much, how big of Twitch cost would be AWS? Uh, I don't think it it's segmented that way. I'm not, I, again, I'm not an expert. I've talked to a finance guy, but um, because Twitch is owned by Amazon, it's not recorded in the same way as a cost. Um, do you think there's a point where Amazon would abandon Twitch? No, I don't think so. Unless, unless Twitch lost. You know, like the way Google or Facebook abandoned Facebook gaming and the way... Microsoft abandoned Mixer. 
If Twitch lost all its users, they'd abandon it. But as long as it has users, they'll just keep trying to figure out how to monetize it. Um, I was honestly, I dropped Prime though because shopping on Amazon has continually degraded. That's what I'm saying, okay? If you're deciding whether or not to keep Prime, the fact that there is one free Prime subscription does not change your mind. Nothing about Twitch is changing whether or not you buy Prime. Uh, it's only the shopping and maybe the TV, the, the you know, the Amazon Prime video and the music. But the Twitch part is, is not um, strong enough. Um, it's a small diff maybe. Yeah, I think that's the problem. Is it, I think the numbers... Uh, did I ever tell a story about when Twitch launched the game shop? <laughs> <laughs> uh where uh Twitch Twitch was trying to make a Steam competitor. You guys might have been I mean, you guys were around for this. I assume if you watched Twitch in 2018, anyone before COVID. They wanted to launch um 2017 really, 17 or 16. And uh this is like one of the later pro it's like one of the projects I worked on at Twitch before I quit. And it's one of the things that made me want to quit. Because <laughs> I remember they were like, all right, they had some Amazon guys come in too. And they were all like, we were all in a meeting and they had a whiteboard, right? And uh, <laughs> they were writing projected sales numbers for the first week on their whiteboard. And it was in the, it was, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking like 40 to 60 million or something. Something crazy. Maybe I'm maybe I'm smoking reefer. I forgot. It was it was a huge number. It was it was big, right? They were just talking about how like okay, so even on our low estimate, and the low estimate was like twenty million. Even on our low estimate, we'll still be able to, you know, make back the cost, and this will healthy. And then the project, projected growth, you know, they had like a up into the right graph and numbers, and it was. I just remember vividly this meeting. And I remember I was talking to like Jay Witch something and I was like, man, this seems like a bad idea. Like, why would people buy here and not Steam? <laughs> like, what what the fuck is the advantage? Or at the very least, why not integrate it into Amazon and they can buy it through Amazon? Because we're we're part of Amazon now. But it was like an entirely separate, shitty storefront connected to Twitch. And so anyway, you know, we're saying that, but nobody's listening. And these fucking executive people higher level, not even executive, director level people, were like forcing it down mid, just saying how great it was going to be. And then we launch it, and I remember... <laughs> I remember uh, we got the updated sales numbers or the updated graph at, for the first week when they were still doing the reporting on it, and it was like... It was like zero dollars. I mean, it was like $600. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was something... It was absurd. It was it was like a insanely low. Like like shockingly, horrendously, hilariously low. Like nobody was using it. And after that week, they never reported on it again. <laughs> Everyone who had been championing it, like pretending they never fucking supported it. They jumped to other teams or they, you know what I'm saying? It was like it was a complete abdication. And it was sunset almost immediately. Like they 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 shut it down so quickly. And uh, I remember thinking, wow, that's so fucked. Because <laughs> I had to work on, like, I had to work on some of the launch marketing for it. Uh, we had to do, we did, like, a uh, some Twitch Weekly thing, some social stuff, and, like, a video. Maybe an email marketing. We did, like, a whole thing for it. And, like, I remember thinking there's no way to sell this. Because there's no, there's no answer to the question, why the fuck would anyone use this over Steam? <laughs> and, and. Yeah, so. Um, same thing happened to Discord's game shop. Yeah, Discord did it after Twitch. I remember that because I was talking to a Discord employee at um, either PAX or TwitchCon. They had a Discord booth and I was still working there or I had just quit. And I was talking to them and I was like, hey, so you guys are working on a store, huh? Uh, we did the same thing at Twitch and it was a pretty big flop. <laughs> you know, the big problem is nobody has a good reason why they wouldn't go to steam. What do you, what is your guys answer to that? <laughs> and he like, he just stared at me kind of blankly. Cause he had been, we were talking about, he's like, he was so excited. He was like, yeah, it's going to be amazing. Like it's going to be built right in the discord. You're gonna be able to buy games. And I was like, okay. 
Yeah, but why would they not just use Steam? And he, he like paused. <laughs> like he'd never fucking thought of that question. Like that never crossed his mind. And I was like, oh, don't, no, you know, because I'm, I'm in person. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not going to try fucking co confrontation here. I was like, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure you guys are, <laughs> you know, it makes sense. You guys are, no, it seems cool. But like in my mind, I was like thinking, this is fucked. This is no, this is no, this makes no sense. Um, Atriok, low key, my favorite part of cons is to crush the soul of dumb innovators. <laughs> you sound like an asshole. <laughs> that sounds terrible. What? The, why is that your favorite part of cons? Not hanging out with friends or fucking seeing the 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 shows or the content or you like walking around to different booths and crushing dreams. <laughs> That's not cool. No, I, I was talking about discords because it was one uniquely bad example. I didn't get a fucking thrill out of it. Um, hey, truck, I've saved up enough for a down payment for a house in the Bay Area. Should I go in now or wait for lower interest rates? Everybody at, at Pact Fulfillment and call him Richie Rich. <laughs> Call him fucking Jeff Bezos snob yacht wearing asshole. This guy's the enemy, dude. This guy's fucking first. You have enough for a down payment on a house in the Bay Area? That's at least 400 grand, 300 grand. I guess 20% versus. Um, uh, no, what, what, here's what I'll tell you. And again, no one has the answer. Let me repeat that. Let me repeat that. Nobody has the answer. Nobody in the world knows exactly what's going to happen. It's been a very interesting time. Almost everything that would normally torpedo the housing market is active right now. Prices should be cratering. But because there is so little supply, because everyone that has a house with a 30-year mortgage they got a while ago with a 2% rate is refusing to sell and there's a huge glut of 30-year-olds and 31-year-olds and 32-year-olds that want to buy. It's evening out. So it's a very precarious position. At any moment, there could be a, a large reduction in prices. Your question asked if you should wait for lower interest rates. That's not That doesn't matter so much. Because if you get a high interest rate loan and interest rates go down, you can refinance. So that, that shouldn't hold you back. What you should be worried about is price. If you buy now, you're buying at like a very high price. Um, so so that's your thing. So you, you have to decide. Uh, it depends on how long you can wait, you know? I, I am personally, again, this is not financial advice. I am personally of the belief that we are, um, buying now w would be more ill-advised. I, I think you will get a better deal relatively soon i'm of the belief that within a year uh we were going to see declines but if you're richy rich and you need a house now understand that that makes total sense and you can refinance your loan um uh, he's like an energetic kindergartner today guys <laughs> there's nothing wrong with having energy energy is good i think energy is great Uh, or just buy five houses somewhere else. Yeah, I'd also tell you that buying in the Bay Area, man. Yeesh. That's a lot of money. You can put towards a lot of things. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I, 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 you're also like, are you sure you want to be in the Bay Area for 30 years or whatever? If you're putting a 20% down, you got a lot to pay. I just understand that's a fucking... Um, or gamble all of it. Yeah, you know what you should do is take that down payment, put it all on red, okay? Double it, put it all on black, double it again. Use that, buy a house in cash, easy clap. Start becoming a landlord. Take your rent money that you get from your tenants, put that on red, double it. <laughs> uh... Suddenly you're fucking, you know what I'm saying? You're just, you're printing money. Is that that is financial advice by the way? That one is. 
Jay Adams, think of the 25. DNA, think of the prime. Sanguine Phoenix, think of the 25. Ray Stryker, think of the prime. It's Pandas, think of the prime. The one year of prime. Thank you, it's Pandas. We truly live in an age of wonders. I am of the belief that old dudes owning multiple houses they leave to gather dust is why we're in this housing problem. Um, I, I, wealth inequality and housing as a uh, investment vehicle are keys to this problem, yes. Um, but, you know, you're, you're thinking of old dudes like it's like one boomer with two houses. And more realistically, it's like BlackRock with like, you know, four million houses <laughs> that, you know, that that that's that's your bigger issue. Um, uh, but again, they, they will likely lose a fuck ton of money. The problem is this is my, my biggest my biggest anger with all of this is that um, there's these stupid bets that larger corporations make. That make them um, a little bit of money consistently with high risk. And so they just take out massive, massive loans and they do a million times and they print money and it goes really well. And then I'm waiting because I know this is fucking stupid. What you're doing is stupid and will lead to your downfall. But then when it actually does, when the fucking, when the fucking check comes due, when they're buried in the mountain of debt, when finally their bad decisions catch up to them and they lose fucking $100 billion in a week and everything goes to shit, they just get a bailout. <laughs> like, nobody goes to jail. Nobody is sent to the fucking poorhouse. The government comes in and bails them out. And that's the fucked part most of all. Because if they actually got truly fucked once, it would leave a fucking lasting impression and we wouldn't have these problems so much. Because there would be serious personal risk if they made such dumb decisions. But there's like this moral hazard where they almost are encouraged to do it. It's fucked. Dude, it's happening right now with um, commercial real estate, like fucking office buildings uh, in downtowns. You know, these big office towers that are like half empty. So a lot of companies took out huge loans, $800 million loans to buy these office buildings, okay? And they can't make the payments on these loans anymore. <laughs> but... But these scum fucks put into the contracts when they took out the loans <laughs> that if they can't make their payments, they can give back the building rather than have to pay the rest. This is what, this is fucking, so what they're all planning to do is give back all of these buildings at once. Just return the keys to banks that can't do anything with them. And the bank takes a big fat loss and then rebuy them at foreclosure, basically, from the bank for pennies in the dollar. So, it, <laughs> and the banks will be fucking torpedoed, obviously, with these massive losses, but the but the government will bail them out because they've already implicitly guaranteed that all banks are going to get bailed out. So they're basically just going to offload all the dumb decisions they made onto their nearest bank, <laughs> and then the bank will get bailed out from the government. That's the fucking plan. I don't know if this plan will work, but that's what I'm understanding is currently the plan. And it's fucked. It's fucked. They should, they should just get owned. It makes me mad. Why doesn't the government bail me out of my college loans? Well, they kind of tried to, right? They, they did. <laughs> then it got blocked and now it's up in the air, but uh, they did. I mean, that was the, that. Uh, once that starts again, bro, that's the real fucking. Um, if we just let BlackRock own all the property, then property prices will be stabilized. <laughs> You're, you should be president. I love that. I love that idea. I love where your head's at. Hey, Shrek, what's the incentive for governments to bail out banks? Mass panic. People that lose their money in a bank riot. <laughs> if you have your money in fucking Charles Schwab and it goes under and you don't get your money, you lose your mind. But more importantly, rich people lose their mind. <laughs> Because they have more than 200K in there. Uh, bank runs scare people, cause mass societal panic, unrest. Um, what pissed me off was uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Because that bailout was only for hyper wealthy fucking venture capitalists. <laughs> Nobody who lost, who would have lost money in Silicon Valley Bank was like a fucking regular Joe. 
It was all incredibly wealthy people that probably would have made still 80 cents on the dollar for what they had. So it's frustrating, dude. It frustrates me. Because we, we you know, it's what it really is, is socialism for the rich. We, <laughs> it's like, we actually do have socialism. It's just only for the rich. It's only for wealthy. Like everything is safe. They have a massive fucking safety net for many fuck ups. Would you say the government is glazing the rich? Yes. Yes. The government is glazing the rich. I'll say it. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be based enough to say it. Uh, MLK literally said socialism for the rich, capitalism for the poor. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Because, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It just it, it annoys me when they, it's already a rigged game, right? But then they play it so wrong that they fuck up and lose, and then they get bailed out. That pisses me off. If they were just allowed to lose, it would still kind of even out. Like, the, uh, ugh, ugh. It frustrates me. Um... Mm. bailing out nft investors is the ultimate burn well they deserve it okay nft investors are like christ's warriors <laughs> if i'm i'm not being too dramatic but they really are like angels you know uh, among us but they're not sus i feel like they they're saviors if they were they're christ-like like every time somebody buys an NFT, an angel gets their wings. They're the crewmates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're like the crewmates of life. Did we get smarter today? Well, we're using Among Us metaphors to discuss uh, the U.S. financial system. So, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, I know. I'm a big fan of MLK. I just like to ask dumb questions. <laughs> I like that you have to like specify that you're a big fan of MLK. <laughs> big fan, dude. Big fan. Love his work. Huge fan. We stand. Are you making fan cams of MLK? <laughs> MLK, I know it's unpopular. I think he was cool. I like him. <laughs> um, he's kind of a daddy. Yeah, <laughs> he kind of ate with that. Uh, I have a dream speech. <laughs> he kind of slayed. You know what I'm saying? Like he left no crumbs. <laughs> when he denounced. Uh, systematic racism he left no crumbs dude uh, he's giving equality <laughs> I fuck with his vibes dude I swear to god I fuck with I fuck with his vibes uh, he busted it down activist style so true this is like the world's longest terrible SNL sketch. <laughs> Zoomer goes back in time to, to the I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> and it's like eight minutes long and it gets progressively worse. Jake Novak wrote it. He stars. He stars as MLK. Um, uh, he rizzed up America. I don't know that he did that. Who... I think the only person who truly rizzed up America is JFK. He charmed the pants off America before he lost his head. Uh, oh, Michael Jackson rizzed up the world, really. Pete Davidson? Pete Davidson hasn't won me over, dude. He hasn't won me over. I wouldn't date him. And he's been trying. <laughs> I think it irks him, dude. 
I think the one thing that ruins Pete Davidson day is knowing that he hasn't won me over yet. I think he sits there furious, fuming. What about baby Gronk? I don't know shit about baby Gronk and I never will. I've decided not to learn. Uh, you're straight. I'm half by. So careful. It's pride month. Don't call me straight, dude. I'm not a fucking, I'm not straight. I'm not part of the straights. <laughs> uh, I'm an ally. I'm a soldier and I'm half by. JFK had the baby. Uh, I don't want to hear about this. I don't want to hear about the fucking, I don't care about the fucking baby Gronk shit. Uh, is baby Gronk an emperor's new groove bit? No, but I wish it was. I love emperor's new groove. God, that movie rules. The half buy thing is your worst bit, IMO. Let me read your chat messages. I think your worst bit. <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to be honest with you. I was hoping to find some bad bits in your chat history, but you have 999 messages and almost every single one is let him cook Poggies or Pepe laugh. <laughs> so you're actually a chat. You literally have three messages uh, almost your entire history. This is crazy. Yeah, you don't have you don't have any bad bits. You win. <laughs> uh <laughs> Did you see Green Suiji got the 70-star record? I did. If you guys don't know, Green Suiji is the guy that got the 16-star record. Now he has the 70-star record by like 14 seconds. Dude's an absolute speedrunning Chad. He is one record away from the perfect 5 for 5. Uh, Look at this Chad, dude. Zero star first, one star first, 16 star first. Uh, 70 star he got today or yesterday. It says fifth, but it's not updated. He has first. So he only needs 120 and then you will have, I think the, I think the first person in human history to ever have five for five in SM64 and also just like probably the greatest speedrunning achievement of all time. If he gets 120, I, I I think it's easy to call that the greatest speedrunning achievement of all time. And it's not close, really. Uh, it, it's That's kind of absurd. Except for maybe getting uh, the first four-hour Hitman 3 trilogy hard trilogy run. <laughs> that was kind of like the greatest of all time, but this is a good second. Um... It would be cooler if it was different games. That's 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 a crazy ask, dude, for a game. This is like the speedrunning game. And no one's ever done all the different categories. It's crazy. It's just crazy. Um, honest to God, 120 is another, another level of difficult. Uh, maybe. I, I, I don't think 70 and 120 are another level of difficult. I think this guy can easily do it. <laughs> I think he's got the skill. <laughs> Squeak save us? Yeah, I think Squeaks will be the one to take him down. It would be crazy if tomorrow, you know, Squeaks turns on stream and just knocks out all five. <laughs> just back to back to back to back. Just cranks it out. He could probably do it. Um... Crazy, that would be expected. <laughs> Are all of his records really far ahead? Yeah, that's the crazy part. Is not only did he break all the records, he broke them by a mile. Um, yeah, his times are absurd. He's he's just he's incredible. I mean, it really is kind of like a I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. He's he's cracked. I mean, again, sixteen star. That was two months ago. Two months ago, he got this, and I don't think anyone's gotten any closer. Yeah, no one's gotten any closer. <laughs> I 
No one, no one's even running anymore. I heard sixteen star. They kind of gave up. I heard he killed the category with this. Um, it's just so far ahead that it's ridiculous. Yeah, I don't know. Is he better than Messi? He's better than Messi at Super Mario sixty four. If that's your question. Um. If you devoted the next three years of your life to running 16 star, you could beat it. I don't think so. Um, because and I'll tell you why, because the maybe second greatest melee player of all time, Armada quit melee and did just that. And it's been three years and he's not even on this list. He's not even on this list, bro. He's, I mean, he's, Maybe he's down here. I don't I don't know where Armada is, but he He's been doing it, dude. Uh this game's hard as shit. He does 70 star? Okay, but is he on the list? Let's find out. Armada. Armada. Oh, there he is. 19th. <laughs> 14 days ago. And Armada is fucking amazing, dude. Armada's a god gamer. He's been grinding, but he's 19th. You know what I'm saying? This game's hard. This game's fucking hard. And highly competitive. I think you made a mistake. You said second greatest melee player. I said what I said. <laughs> Might be third if I count JMook, bro. Uh, it's fourth behind Moki, Moki, and Moki. No, oh, come on, dude. Come on, dude. Uh, it's not as hard as Paper Mario. It's not as hard. <laughs> actually. What is the speed run for Paper Mario? Paper Mario Origami King. H Goat is not number one. <laughs> H goat. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Fucking six hours forty six minutes is the speed run? The any percent speed run? That's so fucking slow. You could beat that? <laughs> maybe, maybe next time Mario Day. Yeah, you know what? I cannot. <laughs> Someone needs to submit my combined VODs at the end so I can get a five-year time. Uh, my run needs to be at 30-second place. Yeah, spliced, of course. No, actually, it's not segmented. I, I will just say it's been running in the background the whole time. And I took long breaks, but it's never, <laughs> it's not segmented. Uh... Hey, truck, as someone who goes to the gym regularly, any advice on getting started? Um, it's, it's too obvious. What you... <laughs> I'm trying to think of some. Uh, uh, I, I would say, okay, here's an actual piece of advice. Here's an, other than just go forehead. Here's an actual piece of advice is that, um, this was, this was when I first went to a gym in San Jose, when I was working at NVIDIA, I basically didn't go to the gym the entire time I was at Twitch. Okay. I just played games and then I wanted to, you know, not fucking have my muscles atrophy. So I went to a gym and the the guy was this fucking ex-military guy, really fucking shredded, big, and he was like showing me around. The first workout was free and he was like, yeah, we're going to sign you up. And I was like pumped, dude, because the workout was good and I liked the guy and I was like, yeah, I'm going to get shredded. And I was like, okay, I want to sign up for, you know, five days a week. And he, he looked me in the eye and he said, <laughs> no disrespect and no offense. If you sign up for five days a week, 
there's a good chance you'll do it for a week and then quit. <laughs> and he said, I think what you should do is sign up for two. I think you should start with two and get it consistently. And I'm going to be dead honest with you. First of all, that guy earned my loyalty for a long time because he downsold me. Like he didn't, he could have made way more money. Uh, and I would have just skipped a bunch of classes. Instead, he got me on two. Secondly, he was 100% right. Because I had done that before. I had feast or famine where you jump in trying to go crazy. Then you burn out. If you try to add too many habits at once, you just fucking quit. You got to be small with it. And you have to understand that things take fucking time. So what I would tell you is set two days a week and go. Just if you nail that and you do that consistently for a month, two months, it's going to start to become a habit. And then it'll be easier from there to add a third or a fourth. But if you try to do it all at once, it'll be too much. Um, so that's my advice I'll give you is like, is like, uh, start small, but not the thing. The one mistake people make when they start small that I've seen is that they, they start so small that it doesn't even count. <laughs> They're like, okay, start small. That makes sense. And they start so small that they don't even do anything really, or they have absolutely no hard number. So not even like two a week. It's like, I went once this month. I did it, you know, or whatever. It's, it's like, you have to. I think two a week or something like that is a good way to go. Um, make it a hard concrete number so you can make that number eventually go up. Um, Atrock, but then he lost all your respect because he wasn't wrestling hard enough? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he earned my loyalty but lost my respect because he didn't try to get more money. <laughs> I was like, damn, I can't... Even though you're stronger than me, I feel like I could beat you mentally because you're not trying to extract every dollar from my from my wallet. Um, even if you just watch Big A at the gym, at least you're still there. No, <laughs> no, I don't recommend that your, your habit be go to my gym and watch me there. That doesn't, that's not, that doesn't count as working out that that's stalking. If anything, that doesn't, mm. um, Um, something about super sore muscles bro just, just i mean this is the harder advice easier said than done but you know if you get sleep eat right get sleep um honestly i think i'm pretty good about going to the gym i go pretty regularly and i also get my 10 12k steps a day my problem is sleep i just if I if I get consistent sleep for like two weeks, I feel like a superhero. I feel so fucking smart. I feel strong. <laughs> I feel good. But if I get inconsistent sleep, which is what I do almost all the time, it fucks me over. It just makes it everything harder. It's my biggest. It's my biggest problem. Uh, I don't even eat unhealthy. I eat pretty healthy. I drink a lot of water. I don't drink soda. I work out pretty much. But I just I get such bad sleep, man. I, I got. I don't know. I got. It's my biggest problem. Um. Start with two days. You're actually right. You're honest to God right. What I should do is have two days of perfect sleep <laughs> and see if I can get it up. I've done it before. Occasionally I can do it, but it's just, it's it's my hardest. Um, how do you guys live life without substance abuse? I don't get it. <laughs> okay, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Sincerely. I, <laughs> I hope it's like more of a uh, ironic, dark humor joke. Uh, one second. Let me get water. Speaking of substance abuse, let me get water.
Yep, hydration. Quack, don't give advice, you f fucking... Don't give our secrets out, all right? Everything you've done as an employee is fucking under NDA. He said, real answer is find someone who really enjoys the content and someone you can grow with. I was a terrible editor when I first started out. And Atrock was a much smaller streamer. I'd like to think we both improved at our own things. Uh, he's honestly right. Yeah. That, well, that's what I like about my editing team. Oh, hey, by the way, uh, videos. I mean, the plan is next week. Straight up. I'm not streaming tomorrow. Um, uh, I should have my update video on Monday and then actual videos by like, I don't know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Hold them accountable. Yeah, I'm telling you guys to hold myself accountable because I keep putting off this update video and I'm like, I should just do it. So that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> um, Quack has gotten better at editing and Big A has gotten better at dodging his invoices. <laughs> yeah. Our two skill sets keep climbing. You know what I'm saying? He keeps making more videos and I get better and better at not paying him. It's real arms race, yeah. No, I mean, all the videos on the channel, like the old videos on my channel, the editing is dog shit. <laughs> no disrespect to anyone who did them, but they're just bad. And then it gets better over time, which is cool. I think almost everyone we added to the team was someone who like was their first time editing or like beginning and they got better. Uh, hey, Big A, long question here. My girlfriend's dad works in the film industry. Okay, flex. Um, uh, is your girlfriend's dad, Steven Spielberg? I was wondering if you think the writer strike will last longer than the previous one. And if there's any factors different than the 2007 strike that can make this one last longer, such as the rise of AI. Yeah, man, I do. The last writer strike lasted exactly 100 days in 2007. And in that time, it was pandemonium. Shows like The Office couldn't make new episodes. Um, tons of popular shows of the day. Back then, late night shows like Jimmy Fallon, or not Jimmy Fallon, um, Jay Leno, uh, David Letterman, all of that, uh, they were popular. <laughs> Crazy as it sounds, they had tons of viewers and like were big polls uh, for the networks, and they couldn't run without writers. Uh, heroes, um, all that stuff. And so in 2007, there was a real fucking pressure on the studios, who, by the way, had not expected the writers to actually strike. The studio heads were saying like they'll never actually strike. And so when they did, it caught them flat footed and uh, they had to make a deal. And so the writers basically won in 2007. They didn't win as much as they could because the director's guild kind of fucked everything by uh, signing their deal early and putting pressure on. But ipso facto, end of the day, writers, writers got a, a, a big progress in 2007. With this writer's strike, all of the studios were ready. They knew it was coming ahead of time. They've been stockpiling content and they have built-in scabs in the form of overseas writers uh, and overseas production companies. Like, you know, Squid Game is made in Korea, just for example. They're not part of the writer strike. And so the studio heads are much more prepared this time, are sitting on boatloads of cash, and there's been a glut of content. So the average user is not demanding new shows right now. They will. Again, no Stranger Things. That's a problem. Um, you know, there's there's big shows that I know the writers are going to hurt. But, like, the average person has a lot of shows to catch up on. So, uh, what I will say is my, my initial worry is that the studios are in a much better position than they were uh, negotiating-wise than in 2007. So, the writers are going to have to strike for longer than 100 days. In my mind, it's like, it's like, a, it's like for sure. It's got to be longer. And that means the pain is going to be hard on the writers who aren't getting paid and are living off of the strike fund. So I get I get worried for the writer strike. I really wanted to succeed. I believe in the cause. I think it's I think their cause is just, but uh, I think they're up against a tough tough uh, studio system. Um. What's the cause of the strike? I mean, there are many causes, but the main is that writers uh, are being squeezed. Their job is being squeezed to get paid less and less and get less and less consistent guaranteed work. Um, 
for example, like if you were a writer on a TV show before, you'd be part of a writer's room that would work for the whole season. You'd be allowed to come to the set. You'd get paid every episode. Now what they do is like these, um, they're like, I don't know, pre-rooms or something. Some kind of early mini rooms. Yeah, they do them before the show starts. They get everybody in a room to make all the ideas for the season ahead of time. Then they split off to do individual episodes and they give them all to the show creator at the end who has to handle, who, who is the only person that is on for the whole duration of the show. So they can basically pay the writers way less, almost like a gig job, um, and save a lot of money. Uh, there's that. There's like a ton of uh, reduced opportunities for young writers to rise up and like learn the ropes. Um, and of course, they are thinking of ways to like use AI to reduce the need of writers altogether or like limit the use of writers. So the big thing Strike is about is like, you know, more consistent pay, more consistent access to upside. Again, if you were a writer before, like if you're a writer in the 90s and you write Friends, let's say you're just a fucking random writer and you write the show Friends, you're set for life. <laughs> you get a big fucking upside because your show hit it out of the park. Nowadays, when you write for streamers, you get a one-time guaranteed paycheck and basically no upside. So if your show is a smash hit, like if you wrote something great, it means nothing. You get nothing extra. There's no there's no bonus. Uh, there's no upside. Um, so so that's the problem. That's why they're striking. Okay, and I think it's I think they have a lot of fair and, and valid and good points, and I hope they succeed. But the studios are more ready. Is my only concern. Thankfully, the uh, Actors Guild has also voted to uh, allow the option to strike. I don't know if they've actually started striking yet, but if the actors join in, that helps a lot. The actors would help a lot to put pressure on the studios. Um, if they stop the strike right now, do you think they have any decent deal? No, <laughs> no. If they stop the strike now, they get, they get nothing, no progress. The studios have budged on nothing. They're refusing to even negotiate. Um, if they ask really nicely, do you think they might get a better deal? Bob Iger, please. <laughs> Please give me more money. <laughs> I don't know. It could work. Could work. I've decided to side with the giant corporations. King. <laughs> I think people unironically do that in a lot of situations. I think people have this mental thing where like if someone powerful is picking on someone with less power... There's some people that just like like to side with the powerful side because <laughs> it makes them feel stronger. I legitimately feel like this is I, I, this is like a a psychological thing. People just like being on the side of the winning team, even though they're like it doesn't mean anything to them. They don't get anything from it. They don't because it feels bad to be on the team that loses, you know, or like has a harder struggle. <laughs> um. Uh, AKA Man City fans. <laughs> I, mean, I talk about this a lot, but I, it, it, there's that one thing in that book, uh, influenced by Cialdini, where it's like, um, you know, they called people in a town to ask them how the sports, the local sports team did last night. You know, and, and if the team won, they'd always say we won. And if the team lost, they'd always say they lost. <laughs> People just always feel like they're part of the winning thing, but they disassociate from the losing. <laughs> uh, and it's like, that's just human psychology. And so it's, it's, uh, always play both sides. So you're always on top. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, cognitive dissonance. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, I've been loving that book. Thanks for the recommendation. No problem. I always like when people read the books that I recommend and then send me little messages about them because I always believe that 0% of you ever read a book in your life. <laughs> so anytime someone proves me wrong, I always feel a little nice. Uh, reading is my only good hobby right now. It's the only thing that I feel like I, other than working out. Reading and working out. The rest of my day, I, I need to fucking do more productive things. Um... <clears throat> Which book? It was called The Very Hungry Caterpillar. 
uh, it's a very it's a very advanced book. Um, it's it's a fire book. I don't know the name, but there's this big shiny fish, bro. That book fucking sucks. The rainbow fish book. This book is so whack, dude. Just, no, don't capitally call me. I'll explain. Let me cook. <laughs> Do you, if you don't, this is the book I'm talking about. This fucking book. This guy walks around. He's got shiny, awesome, glittering scales. And everyone's fucking jealous of his ass. And the solution at the end of the book is for him to rip off of his scales and give one to everyone. He has to mutilate, self-mutilate his own body and give everyone one of his fucking scales. <laughs> and that's the happy ending. Instead of just fucking being himself, <laughs> the way he was born, he has to rip his body up so no one else feels a pang of jealousy and they don't have fucking shiny scales. Uh <laughs> communism <laughs> uh, communism is when no shiny scales. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have shiny scales in communism. That's fucking true, dude. I I'll know you're a fucking capitalist dog if you have shiny scales. Um This is the future liberals want. Which one? I can't even tell. <laughs> So you think it's mutilation for this fish to get gender affirming surgery? I don't think that affirms the fish's gender to remove their scales. I don't think it's related to gender. I think the fish just got bullied into fucking losing its scale straight up. <laughs> I think this book is about a fish that looks fucking fly as hell getting bullied. <laughs> uh... Ishrak, what's your take on Microsoft's new filings against the FTC? What's my take? It's not drama. <laughs> it's not it's not fucking hot goss, dude. <laughs> my take is Microsoft was too far on that one. Tea time. Uh no. It, Microsoft is trying to get this fucking blizzard deal through at all costs. And the UK is consistently blocking it. So they're legitimately thinking about not allowing Activision games to be sold in the UK. As long as they can get it through in America. But America recently sued to block it as well. Not, not fully, but they've delayed. So again, it's delayed longer. So Microsoft is getting pissed. And they're trying to force it down mid. Get it through in America. And just fuck off with the UK. That's their plan. And it's because they spent $70 billion on Blizzard. And they want to fucking have the company. They want to own it so they can make it part of Microsoft. UK based actually unironically I'm shocked the UK has held to their guns on this Microsoft has so much money and power and lawyers and they've not um Blizzard over here pulling up their skirt to reveal their thaws, thighs and saying, you want some of this? $50, baby. It's got to be one of the weirdest messages I've ever heard. <laughs> I don't get it at all. I don't understand it. I don't I don't think it was an appropriate description of what's happening. <laughs> I don't think you cooked. I don't think you ate. I think you left a lot of crumbs. I think your, your plate is covered in crumbs. <laughs> I think you barely touched your food, actually. 
I, I think you're like a picky Peter, and you you left a lot of the plate. The food is the food's untouched. Um. <clears throat> Big A, do you see people actually molding at the FTC in the UK for doing their jobs? I can't. Yeah, of course. Gamers. The thing is, the problem is that every gamer who hears about this news on Twitter is like not somebody who cares about, you know, big business or monopolies or um, corporate authority or anything. They care about whether Microsoft or Sony wins the console war. <laughs> Like they're, they're not even, they're literally like the people on Twitter are all like any news that is good for the console that my parents bought me is good. And if it's bad for the console my parents bought me, it's fucking dog shit. It's cra it's crazy. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying I never fought in the wars. Okay. I'm a veteran. I, I did two tours <laughs> in the GameSpot forums. But uh, those were a long time ago. That's about when Nintendo needed me. You know what I'm saying? When the Nintendo Wii needed a soldier to fight, I stood up and I I, I, let, I let myself be counted. Uh, <laughs> I was in the shit, dude. Nintendo Wii is like being in fucking uh, Antietam, dude. It's like being in the trenches of World War One. It's D-Day. <laughs> if you were a Nintendo Wii fan on launch day... Holy God, you saw brothers die. <laughs> yeah, I looked to my left and right and I saw people die. Because it was fucking, I remember it was called the fucking revolution. And everyone in the GameSpot forum was like, Nintendo Revolution? That sounds fucking giga chatted. And they said it's called the Wii. <laughs> oh, blood guts. <laughs> the fucking smell, dude. Could you find any of your old forum threads? I think GameSpot deletes. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I did find... Um... What's this? <laughs> no, it's all deleted. <laughs> I found me Pokemon battling on the Penny Arcade forums <laughs> in 2007. Uh... Mm. Do you think they never stood a chance because they kept losing their Wii remotes? The Wii... The Wii did amazing. <laughs> the Wii did amazing. It sold a bazillion. It just sold it to families and like little kids, you know. Uh, the Wii, the Wii sold more than the both of them. It just didn't have as many games. It was just not good for like edgy thirteen-year-old forum goers, you know. If you're a fucking thirteen-year-old boy and PlayStation has like fucking cool shit and good graphics, and you get the fucking Wii and it's called the Wii, you get made fun of. That's it. That's why it was bad. They didn't have shooters, you know? Um, the Wii and the Magna Carta are the two most important landmarks in history. You dropped that and you deafened me. <laughs> so, no matter, you don't even want to hear my response to that? No, you don't. Nothing more needs to be said. So true. So based. <laughs> so fucking wise. Uh, wait, how about this? I'm going to ask ChatGPT. ChatGPT. To write me a musical. Okay. Write me a musical. Write write me a song from a Hamilton inspired Hamilton like musical <laughs> about the video game.
console wars from the perspective of soldiers fighting for Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo. <laughs> Set it in 2007 around the release of the Nintendo Wii. Verse 1, Xbox soldier. In the year of 2007, on a mission like a dare we have been given. There's a war no one's seeing. It's a fight, our weapon, Xbox, shining in the night. <laughs> a green ring of light, our guiding star. In the console war, we're raising the bar. <laughs> Halo rings out a cry in the night. With our Xbox 360, we're prepared to fight. <laughs> Chads, <laughs> okay. Console wars, oh what a fight in the shadows of technology's night. Battles fought not with guns or swords, but with controllers, headsets, and digital rewards. <laughs> Verse two, PlayStation shoulder. PlayStation in my hands, feeling the heat, a force to reckon with, never known defeat. With a dual shock in my grip, I stand tall. In the console wars, PlayStation won't fall. <laughs> Blu-ray disc spinning, game looking so bright. Through day and through the darkest night, resistance uncharted, our battle cry. With our PS3, we'll never die. <laughs> Console wars, oh what a fight in the pursuit of graphical might. Not just the game, it's our heart and souls. Victory's our only goal. Then came the Wii with a brand new play. A revolution in gaming clearing the way. Nunchuck in hand, Wiimote swing. In the console wars, Nintendo is king. Super Mario Galaxy, our heroes take flight. Twilight Princess, battle. That was a GameCube game, right? Dual release. With a console for all, young and old, Nintendo's story will be told. <laughs> this is fucking trash. <laughs> it's about the journey, the friendships, the score. This is what we're truly fighting for. Wow. Um. <laughs> I just pictured myself in like a conference room at Netflix and I just finished my pitch and I looked back at them <laughs> and it's just dead silence. I just finished singing the whole song. I got a little fucking slide with <laughs> So that's the that's the show. Um Console Wars, the musical. Um we're ready to shoot. We just need the the budget. Um <laughs> Slowly erupts into a sea of claps. Yeah, exactly. So what do you guys think? Uh, we can tweak some things on the, on the second verse. If that's your problem, don't worry about that. They'd still green light to be honest. Well, they do need writers. <laughs> uh, I think people give too many plays standing ovations. What an what an incredibly small thing to worry about. <laughs> that's 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 your position in life. That's where you're. That, <laughs> if you're a one issue voter, it's that people give too many standing O's at plays. It's who cares? Who care? I, what is I, the worst thing that happens? People give too much praise to creators. If we aren't booing the bad plays, how will the good ones know they're actually good? So true. I hate this fucking participation trophy crap in the play world. <laughs> the notoriously expensive and difficult to succeed in play world. All these spoiled fucking millennials. Uh, it, <laughs> They don't need writers. They just need prompt engineers like you. Yeah, fucking true. 
Wow, we have a certified prompt engineer in chat? Holy fuck. It's an honor, sir. Uh, one second. One second. Oh, let's watch a video on Tom Cruise running. Let's get this Get Smarter Saturday started with a video on why Tom Cruise's run matters. I saw this video uh, in my recommended. It has 3.9 million views. It seems interesting and it's only six minutes long. I wanna watch it, so I'm gonna watch it. Uh, but first. All right, why Tom Cruise's run matters. I don't know why it matters, but this video with the power of YouTube will explain it to us. Uh, <laughs> went to get gummy worms, bro. Um, is this cinema sticks? No, I think it's something else. Atrioc runs like a Goomba. We all know it. There's no human way to run like a Goomba. <laughs> they waddle, dude. A human can't. My feet are not attached in the way. I couldn't do it if I wanted to. I have arms. I'm sorry, what? Ask the storyteller. You said no, ha no arms having ass. I have arms. I, I, that, that, that is not in question. Nobody can deny that I fucking have on. I literally have on. Wait, I'm fucking, they're on. <laughs> Those look like legs to me. No, no. Okay. I see where you're confused. Drop spangle. That makes sense. See, I have legs. I have legs right here. See, arms, legs. Totally different. Totally different. So now that we've cleared that up, I have arms. Everyone can confirm. I don't walk like a Goomba. <laughs> Fucking stupid thing to say. Um, Big A really do be spotting his enemy, hopping slightly, and then running headfirst towards his adversary with reckless abandon. <laughs> I really do be doing that. Big A really do be doing that. No, I don't think that's the case. In fact, I think that is a description of a Goomba, of which I am not. If you can find one clip or example of me ever doing that hopping slightly and then running towards my enemy uh, <laughs> I will call myself Mr. Goomba all right let's uh let's watch this video there's a lot of memorable movie runs Forrest Gump Rocky Run Lola Run even this moment in Get Out but nobody runs on screen quite like Tom Cruise True. including Top Gun Maverick Cruise is now run in 44 of his 52 movies a ridiculous start that has turned into a strange mythical legacy people can't get enough <laughs> of compilation videos and super cuts of TC getting his jog on which has become something of a global joke I mean the man's own Instagram bio bro I want to pause and say Minority Report is a great movie and if you haven't seen it it's probably my favorite Spielberg movie, which is crazy given his full career. I think it's awesome. 
It's not too woke. <laughs> minority Report is too woke? Oh, because of the word minority in the title. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, what are you fucking talking about? It's a fucking movie about sci-fi stopping murder, dude. <laughs> too woke. Just calling a random fucking sci-fi movie. I don't know why that's so funny to me. Uh, just you immediately said it, which is why it's so funny. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, it holds up. I recommend it. You'll like it. It's got good acting in it. Uh, good plot. Good see, everything. I, the movie's great. I, I recommend it. We'll give it a watch. It also is like one of the, I think Minority Report is the most accurate predictor of the future in a sci-fi movie that I've ever seen. Um, Obviously, none of that, you know, Flubber exists, Wally, <laughs> Gattaca, no, all, no. All those movies are, they. it's not how it would play out, you know? But um, Minority Report kind of looks like a lot of things that we're headed towards, like self-driving cars, um, touchscreen interfaces. Um, you know, it's a lot of stuff that wasn't there in 2000. It's got identification, which is interesting. What about iRobot? <laughs> iRobot is like a fucking two-hour advertisement for Converse sneakers <laughs> and Audi cars. If you didn't notice the fucking overwhelming product placement in iRobot, watch it again as an adult. Uh, I think literally at one point, <laughs> dude, that's how <laughs> that's what I knew I wanted to be a marketer. I saw the movie as a kid, and even I, as a child, saw that movie and Will Smith. At one point, holds his shoe up to the camera, slaps it, and says, These Converse are vintage 2004, which was the year the movie came out. <laughs> it's it's like set in 2030. How fucked is that? How little do you care about the plot of your movie? And how much do you want to fucking sell? It's crazy. Although, I Robot does have a goat scene. Where he's talking to uh, Sonny, the robot. I remember a lot of about this movie. I've seen this movie multiple times. Um, and he goes, um, yeah, they're arguing about artificial intelligence. And Will Smith goes, can a robot even paint a symphony? Or compose beautiful music? Write poetry? And then Sonny goes, can you? Chills, bro. Fucking chills. <laughs> chills! By the way, ChatGPT can. <laughs> Let's watch that scene right now. Fuck it. <laughs> can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? Owned! 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 Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? And it's crazy because when this movie came out, they thought that AI wouldn't be able to make a masterpiece or like write music. And now it's like turning like a lady cam. Um, pretty crazy. 
Uh, all right, Tom Cruise. Even says running in movies since 1981 as if that is the only thing he's known for. Going even further, this strange phenomenon has led to actual academics writing reports that correlate his running to a film's box office success, which is pretty hilarious when you think about it. Simply put, it's a meme, it's a joke, it's a given. You get a Tom Cruise movie, he runs. But when I was watching this completely <laughs> unnecessary scene in Maverick the other day, I thought, why do we really care? Why is Tom Cruise running such a part of the social zeitgeist? And more importantly, how the hell do they film this? First things first, it looks really cool. I think that's undeniable. The yeah, only he's... actor who comes close to this level of running aesthetic is probably Daniel Craig. Yeah. He doesn't have anywhere near the body of work that Cruise has, and he doesn't look <laughs> anywhere near as fast. When Cruise is running, he looks like a real-life action figure going 100. That's true. I was just thinking that. Daniel Craig doesn't look nearly as fast. He looks kind of slow. He doesn't have the pace miles an hour, hair whipping in the wind, and it's always so much fun. Like this tracking shot in Mission Impossible 3. Just a fantastic <laughs> movie moment, which probably speaks to Cruz's commitment to his stunts more than anything. We all know he broke his foot while filming Mission Impossible, and oh. it seems like he's trying to find a new way to kill himself in each movie by doing more and more extreme stunts. It is crazy so this he does just this. means he's committed to the spectacle of what he's creating, which makes him one of the last true action stars we have. For me, it's, it's about storytelling and I, I I grew up watching you know Charlie Chaplin Buster Keaton Harold Lloyd you know damn you're old Abbott Costello right, right. you know these they're they're kind of work the that they did the yeah. classics and they they made me laugh and they had tension so these things that I want to I want to really build stories around it that's why I started producing Mission Impossible and I know that very few other actors have the juice well, he, he didn't grow up watching Atriox streams <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Abbott and Costello and Atriox streams. That was his fucking big two. That was the inspiration. In Hollywood to make the demands he does, so it's not entirely fair to compare him to younger actors. Like, no one else would be able to demand that they film an entire movie in airborne F-18s. But then again, who else is going to voluntarily learn to fly a fighter jet or hang off a plane or break this their foot crazy. and still finish the take? <sighs> No one, too much time, effort, and risk. So it's no surprise that Cruz puts this sort of effort into his running scenes as well. The proof? He got better. Or at least according to an ESPN article earlier this year where a panel of Olympic athletes said they noticed a huge improvement in his running style during Collateral in 2004. Which <laughs> means that after running in movies for 23 years at the age of 42, he decided that he could still get better and hired a professional coach. He wanted it to look perfect. A running coach? Screen. The initially flailing run with balled up hands evolved into this upright, straight palm <laughs> style that he's famous for now. And sure, some people think this looks a bit goofy or robotic and I'm sure he was told this was better on camera, which is why he's doing it, but he's still really freaking fast. Even Look at his go, dude. Back style, a blog user calculated that Cruz was running at 15.3 miles per hour. Jeez, the he's sense, a cheater. Which equates to a 14.6 second 100 meter sprint, which, yeah, is not world athlete fast. But in this scene, he's 43, yelling Mandarin at people, travels well over 100 meters. We have no idea how many takes he'd done, and most importantly, he's in full pants and no running shoes. <laughs> which is the craziest Chad. thing about all his runs. He's never in athletic gear, he's wearing jeans or a suit, and he's still absolutely flying so no he's not winning any olympic that's the best part because you never see someone in a suit run <laughs> that's the the that's what i think is the best part of tom cruise runs he's always wearing something that he shouldn't be running in and it it feels out of place and it feels interesting he's a guy uh records, but Jackie Joyner Kersey, a three-time Olympic gold medalist, thinks he could probably run an 11.5 second hundred at 60 years old with a bit more training. Bottom line, he's fast. So fast that he has to slow down for co-stars when they're allowed to run with him. But then how do they make it look this cool? <laughs> Tom Cruise getting pissed at Cameron Diaz because she can't run as fast as him on set would be a fucking hilarious <laughs> behind the scenes. <laughs> Or him just dipping. He just runs so fast, he leaves her behind to die. Running scenes are filmed in a lot of creative ways. Like if there's a character traveling at super speed, the actor often runs on what's called a magic carpet, which is basically a long tarp being dragged along by another vehicle, or they get dragged with a weighted wire system that lifts and propels them. By comparison oh, wow. to this, Cruz's running scenes might seem a bit low key. He's running unassisted for most of his scenes, so surely they just point and shoot, right? Nah. The one stunt I think that probably was the most difficult may not look like that. 
and he was jumping off rooftops. Now these were tile roofs. It required incredible oh, grace, precision, coordination, and footwork. And it looked so effortless. Where's you play that, please? That was tricky. First of all, it was the third to last day shoot of the movie. And then that final day of the sprint. I couldn't wait to do that sprint. Which sprint? Yeah, this one. So clearly there's a lot more elements at play than you think. First, Tom has to be great at hitting his marks and just super fast like he already is. Second, the blocking of all the extras needs to be perfect. Third, a setting that emphasizes his speed. Like this sidewalk is perfect because you have so many stationary yeah. objects to contrast with his dynamic movement. Yeah. And most importantly, you need the infrastructure and tech that can capture someone moving this fast. Incredible. <laughs> you know, technology, the camera, I mean, not rig you're using the spider cam, it was such a... It's not faster than light, bro. <laughs> He's a guy running at non-Olympic speeds. <laughs> we have the technology. <laughs> He's not so. F He's not a blur that you can't pick up on camera. You can use a flip phone and catch him. Yeah, he's not faster than Sonic. <laughs> high-tech device. Spider cam is basically a bunch of uh, rigging equipment. It's not just uh, one system that we put up. So if somebody has a vision or a shot, we build infrastructure to get our system up in the air, and then uh, we program the shot after that. Clearly not every one of his running shots has a spider cam or some elaborate setting. Sometimes he's just been filmed from a car or a dolly or a crane sticking out of the Burj Khalifa. But again, his that ability was to act was while moving this fast, like delivering the dialogue and doing whatever's in the script, makes him him the world's preeminent action star. Say what you want about his off-screen antics and values, but it's impossible to watch the man put this much effort into his craft without showing some sort of appreciation. Yeah, he's good. It's not like he's some B-grade actor. It's Tom Cruise, for God's sake. He's had a decorated career and been- Has he ever won an Oscar? Tom Cruise not having an Oscar feels kind of fucked. Feels like he earned one. Tom Cruise, no Oscar. Wow, he's never gotten one. That feels fucked. Earned for what role? Um, where was he nominated? Tom Cruise Best Actor nomination. Uh, Jerry Maguire. Who did he lose to in '97? Jerry Maguire. He was great in. Best actor. He got it in 1990 and 1997. 97 Oscars. The 69th Academy Awards. Nice. Uh, who won best actor? Jeffrey Rush Shine as David Helfgott. Fucking who megalol, dude. Uh, if you're talking pirates, don't talk to me. <laughs> the woke mob strikes again. <laughs> Bro, Jeffrey Rush should have best actor, but only for playing Barbosa in Pirates of the Caribbean. There are more guidelines than actual rules. <laughs> that, that fucking chills, dude. Fucking chills. But this shine, who the fuck cares? How do you know Jeffrey Rush is? Because he fucking killed it as Barbosa. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. Uh, you best start believing in ghost stories, Miss Turner. <laughs> You're in one. Uh, it's, it's fire, dude. I fucking love it. He fucking kills it. He, he makes the whole movie. A good villain makes the movie. Everybody knows this. <laughs> you have a good Barbosa impression? I have many skills. All right, don't downplay it. Okay, I can do an impression of anyone right now. Give me any actor, living or dead, and I'll do a perfect impression. Any person. Obama. <laughs> he has no Olympic Obama. <laughs> you always pick Obama. It's the only one you ever pick is Obama. Uh, let me be clear. My fellow Americans. <laughs> That's all I have, dude. That's a that's all I've got. It's the only fucking thing I've got. Um. Let 
Now do Obama doing a Barbosa impression. <laughs> uh, let me be clear, Miss Turner. <laughs> You're in one. <laughs> My fellow Americans, you best start believing in ghost stories. <laughs> uh, holy shit. <laughs> now do Barbosa doing an Obama impression? <laughs> My fellow Americans. <laughs> what may be clear? <laughs> Uh, anyway, okay, proof, all right? No more, no more proof needed. I can do any impression of anyone doing anything. Nothing else needed, okay? Now let's finish this film. This fucking... Been in some amazing movies. He's a genuinely good dramatic actor. I'm not through with my examination. Sit down. But for now, out of a great. career and being in movies, he's a genuinely good... Jerry Maguire's great. Jerry Maguire? Well... It's still like a rom-com, I guess, but if you're in touch with your feelings, go watch it. Show me the money, dude. Uh, why'd you skip those five seconds? I wanted to go back to the Jerry Maguire scene. This is a dumb pause, but... Good dramatic actor. I'm not through with my examination. Yeah, Jerry Maguire was genius because they mixed a sports movie with a rom-com to hit everybody in the 90s. <laughs> It's, it was a real... No one could be ashamed at watching it. Mm. Yeah, 90s Ted Lasso, really. Mm. Sit down. But for now, it seems like the rest of his career will be fully invested in pushing the boundaries, creating spectacles, and orchestrating scenes that look amazing in a cinema. Which I'm completely fine with. Like, sure, I'm a bit sad that I probably won't be able to see him in some more dramatic roles, but in a world that's getting taken over by too much CGI and too much green screen, it's incredible that we've got a gatekeeper like Tom Cruise still trying to push out realistic action. So I say, just keep running, Tom. As long as you can, we'll all keep watching. I mean, he's 60. It can't be that much longer. Uh, yeah, I'm a big Tom Cruise fan. I think the Scientology part sucks. Uh, but, you know, outside of him jumping on that couch, it hasn't affected me. But for his work in film in Hollywood, it's impressive. He's a fucking incredible body of work. Tons of his movies have resonated with me over the course of my life. The first Mission Impossible is like, I fucking loved that movie, girl. I thought that movie was so fucking cool. <laughs> um, what's so wrong with Scientology? My understanding is it is a uh, um, bit of a cabal. Like they have a lot of, uh, not only do they, they're predatory in terms of money they take, but they like have done shady or abusive things and then use their influence over powerful people to get it covered up and um they've disappeared women yeah again, I, i'm not gonna conspire i don't know I, i'm not gonna make a claim that i don't have any backup on them but i know that they there's a lot of uh darkness swirling around scientology and, and he doesn't need it, right? I mean, the guy's beloved, world, globally beloved actor. Um, I'm surprised that he has made it such a personal choice of his to be pro-Scientology. Um, but uh, honestly, it hasn't it hasn't seeped into his professional or public life at all, except for like back in 2004 when he was off the perk, dude, and he was like insulting... Although, didn't Matt Lauer end up being a predator and Tom Cruise insulted him? So what the fuck's the problem? <laughs> Tom Cruise base, dude. Mm. Mm. How Microsoft fumbled Halo? I'll watch that. The year is 2021. Oh, it's kind of long. 
A little too long, I think, for me. A little too long. Uh, we're looking for we're looking for something to get smarter, dude. We're looking for interesting videos that'll get us smarter. I love. Can I KO everyone in this mansion without anyone noticing that? What? <laughs> what? That doesn't sound interesting at all. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of tossing a coin <laughs> uh, into a corner. Um, drop spindle. Drop spindle. This is not a get smarter video. This is. Emergency meeting. <laughs> nice, nice, dude. Yeti saying trauma. That's funny. You need a soundboard? Uh, I have one. Thank you very much. We truly live in an age of wonders. Poggers. We truly live in an age of wonders. Poggers. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a deep bench. <laughs> so I don't fucking, don't knock my soundboard. Are those your only two? It's all you need. It covers the whole gamut of human expression and emotion. Uh, Why the fuck did we watch that 30 million view video, Angels Among Us? <laughs> Drop spindle, why did you link that? What? <laughs> What was what the fuck was what was a, what was that about? I don't know why we watched that. I feel so much smarter. We were gonna watch a video, but I we completely lost it. Um. All right, give me a video. Give me a good video. A get smarter video. A video that's gonna make us all more intelligent. Every single person here has a personal need to increase their IQ. To, to deal with the fucking ever-changing global landscape we live in. Every bit of intelligence is a leg up on the global community. We are, we are in a fight for our lives every day. And this knowledge could be the difference. Like this one right here. Uh... You two are down. No, no. Early 90s video game music analysis. <laughs> Short video that will actually make you smarter. It's called The Eight Spiders by Lamino. My worry is that I hate spiders and I'll get creeped out. But I'll watch it. Ah! I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> it creeps me out, dude. I get fucking chills. <laughs> What's it actually about? Oh, it's about swallowing eight spiders while you sleep? Ugh. Abraham Lincoln famously said, If you've read it on the internet, it must be true. A quote that most YouTube list channels seem to have taken to heart. But it is often difficult to know if the things that you read and view online are true or not. Which makes it especially difficult for me as it's part of my job description. The right. last thing I want is to be the source of misinformation. So, in today's video, I'd like to demonstrate how truly difficult it can be and how a single inaccurate citation can lead to an ocean of misinformation. Okay, so a few weeks ago, I stumbled upon a supposed fact. It goes like this. The average person annually swallows eight spiders in their sleep. Wow. I've seen variations of this claim in Must be true. It's in a YouTube video by Lamino. And he researches it. So you can tell your friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Giga Chad, I swallow nine. <laughs> I swallow 16 to save one person. Thank you. Thank you. You're making it better for the rest of us. Uh, I'll watch a little more, it's kind of interesting. ...times before, and it's quite easily dismissible. For example, most household spiders are not exactly fond of wet and windy regions, which is a perfect description of the human mouth. Furthermore, spiders are very sensitive to vibrations, and while asleep, we tend to move around, breathe, snore, etc., which causes the spider equivalent of an earthquake. A human quake? Nevertheless, experts in both human and spider biology can attest to why spider munching in our sleep is highly improbable. Yeah. But it did make me wonder, if the claim is so easily dismissible, how did it begin? And holy community guidelines did I discover a rabbit hole deeper than your favorite inspirational quote. A quick search led me to an article on a website known as Snopes.com. Snopes is a website specializing Liberal in fake news media. legends and most people seem to agree that it is a quite reputable source. In the article they claim that the myth gained popularity in 1993 when a columnist by the name of Lisa Birgit Holst wrote an article titled Reading is Believing in a magazine known as PC Professional. She supposedly wrote the article which included the eight spiders myth to demonstrate how people will believe anything they read online. <laughs> they further claim that she took this myth from a book released in 1954 titled Insect Fact and Folklore. So if Snopes is to be believed, the myth began with a book released in 1954. And to solidify this claim even further, you can find hundreds of articles and books telling the exact same story. Simple enough, quite an interesting piece of trivia, case closed. Mm -hmm. it, or is it? It wasn't for the fact that I bought the book. And it does not include any mention of swallowing <laughs> spiders in your sleep. <laughs> it would be a bit strange if it did, as spiders are not insects, they are arthropods, which is a bit ironically the- Bro, Ari tells me this all the fucking time. It's so annoying. It's so nerge. I keep calling spiders insects, and she goes, um, actually, <laughs> actually, they're not insects. They're arthropods. Uh, it happened because I literally just, as a gift, I made her the modern day equivalent of a mixtape which is to make your significant other a custom Magic the Gathering commander deck. <laughs> yeah, I got Riz, all right? I'm Riz out of my mind. So I, I spent like 300 bucks and had a professional make her a custom insect-based Magic the Gathering commander deck, and there was a spider in it. <laughs> and she said, um, this is really sweet, but they're not all insects. Because <laughs> she loves insects. Uh, so she threw the whole thing in the trash. Yeah. Um, nice try, bud. Yeah, the razor's still out of control. The only thing you will learn about spiders while reading this book. So I went back to Snoop's article and went through the rest of their citations. Two are unrelated to the origins of the myth. Then they cite an article in a 1997 issue of the newspaper Chicago Sun-Times. I was able to read the article thanks to some incredibly kind people over at the Chicago subreddit who sure. provided me with a copy. Unfortunately, it does not shed any light on the origins of the myth as the article only consists of a reader asking if this urban legend is true or not, followed by an entomologist claiming that it is unlikely. That leaves us with citation number three. And this, my friends, is where we go off the deep end. A quick search reveals that I'm not the first to investigate this source, as most of the top results are that of other people looking for the exact same thing. As it turns out, no one has been able to find a columnist by the name of Lisa Birgit Holtz, what? nor has anyone been able to locate a computer magazine by the title of PC Professional. <laughs> At least not what? in the United what? States. What? So perhaps the magazine was published in another country. The name Lisa Birgit Holst does sound quite European and sure enough the given middle and surname is of European origins. Okay. Using various online archives, catalogs and indexes I was able to locate five different magazines with either a similar title or with the exact same title published in a language other than English. Okay. There's a magazine from the UK with the title PC Pro, but the first <laughs> issue was first published in November of 1994. I also found a 
magazine with exact title of PC professional, but it was unfortunately written in an unsophisticated and intelligible <laughs> language known as Danish. The first issue was also published in 1997. A Swedish magazine, Gross. also with exact title of PC professional, published a grand total of what appears to be two issues, one in 1992 and one in 1993. The thing is, if we're searching for an article... It's funny for like that brief window when you would use a computer but not the internet. <laughs> so a magazine would make sense. PC professional it like shouldn't exist as a magazine. Because <laughs> if you're a PC professional, you should be able to look it up online. Responsible for a widespread global misconception. I failed to see how an obscure and short-lived magazine from Sweden with a readership of a few thousand at most could possibly have served as the catalyst. Not to speak of the tremendous improbability of this local magazine then ending up in the hands of an American couple who happens to run a website specializing in debunking urban legends who then also translated the magazine from Swedish <laughs> to English yet failed to mention any of this in the very article they wrote about the topic. Interesting. So uh, let's put it in the maybe pile for now. The last two publications, one from Italy and one from Germany, seem to be the most likely candidates. Both magazines are titled PC Professional in their respective language, had a readership in the hundreds of thousands, wow. and has released monthly issues since 1991. From 91 to the present? What the fuck is going on in Germany, bro? Or is this France? It's Italy? In Italy? In Italy, they're still reading PC Professional? Mamma mia! <laughs> What the fuck? Slow Wi-Fi? What, what the fuck? Dude, it's 2023. At this point, there was no doubt in my mind that the German magazine must contain the article for two main reasons. First, the surname Holst is Danish and German in origin, and thus a really common surname in Germany to this very day. As a comparison, I was only able to track down a single person in all of Italy with a surname Holst. That's crazy. Second, the magazine is the official German version of PC Magazine, which is one of the most popular PC-oriented magazines in the United States. In fact, PC Mag has mentioned its German sister publication on numerous occasions. This had to be it. Okay. And if I wanted to know the truth, there was only one thing left for me to do. I packed my bags, jumped Face on reveal? Plane, and traveled to Germany. On second thought, maybe I should see if I can find it <laughs> online first. Good YouTube skip, plus one. I eventually found a German library that, for a small fee, could send me a scanned copy of page 71 from the 1993 January issue <laughs> of PC Professional. Damn. And here it is. Unfortunately, too blurry. the library who provided me with this scanned copy had some serious copyright restrictions, so I hired a translator to replace the German text with English and then recreated the page in Photoshop. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, because it does not contain anything even remotely relevant to this mystery. No Lisa Holst, no spider misconceptions, no nothing. What? And if this is not it, I highly doubt this article exists. I mean, I even clicked page two on Google search, so you know I've been <laughs> thorough. After pacing back and forth and questioning my own sanity for the better part of the week, I began to wonder if Snopes had, for whatever reason, intentionally provided incorrect information. I then quickly mm. found a Reddit post demonstrating how the name Lisa Birgit Holst is an anagram for this is a big troll. <laughs> uh, unless we are to believe that this perfect anagram is just a random coincidence, it would mean that Snopes has written a meta article about a made-up columnist who once wrote a made-up article about people's willingness to accept false claims as the truth in order to expose people's willingness to accept false claims as the truth. That's incredible if true. Convoluted, sure, but oh did they succeed. 
Almost every mention of this urban legend since has been accompanied by this supposed origin story, which is of course presented as the truth, when in actuality it may be as mythical as the myth it is attempting to dispel. All of these hundreds or even thousands of authors has fallen for the exact same trap as none of them could be bothered to validate a simple citation and gladly lifted information they assumed to be accurate. And it's easy to see why they would make that assumption, because if you search for this urban legend today, this is what you will find. Page after page of articles proudly and unknowingly presenting a fake story in order to disprove that's incredible story that's incredible i should also mention that i contacted snopes on multiple occasions in the hopes that they could shed some light on the whole situation but like everyone else before me i received nothing but an automated reply but even if this godforsaken article exists and the anagram is just a random coincidence, the endless retelling of this story has been told under the pretense that the Lisa Holst article exists and not due to any prior knowledge of its existence. Because the fact still stands, no one has been able to find That's it. That's so interesting. Yet everyone writes as if they have. <laughs> It's the most perfect example of circular <laughs> reporting I've ever come across. And that video ruled, and I didn't think it would. That was a great video. Thanks for thanks for recommending. That was a, that was an excellent video. The $600 million art heist? Interesting. Business dystopia? Bro, don't... Don't fucking trick me. I was maybe... Exerbia? Windover vid on Nebula? Ask Storyteller's got a video? Atrioc exposed for being a Goomba. It's not proof. <laughs> it's obvious. He spent time on that. You missed you missed the great spider video making that, by the way. It says real in the video. Well <laughs> maybe citation that. Vid about the goat ref. To become a the most feared and legendary referee of all time. Alright, kinda interested. Legend inside those four white lines is no easy task. Most had to fight for the ball because that's where the spotlight shines. Defenders had to perform thousands of clean tackles, keepers dozens of unimaginable saves, strikers had to provide a never-ending supply of goals. But there was one man who became a legend in one of the most recognizable faces in the sport without ever touching the ball. Today we're gonna find out how exactly one becomes the most feared, the most respected and by far the most legendary referee in the world, even making the cover of Pro Evolution Soccer. A one that's crazy. Pierluigi. They put a ref on the cover. That's absurd. I mean that there's there's stars of the game and the, the athletes are the stars. Colina. I've never heard of this guy. Watching Colina go about his job was as impressive as watching any other superstars he shared the pitch with. It wasn't just that he seemed to never get a decision <laughs> Chad. wrong, with the sight of a falcon and cold-headed as they got. It was the way he handled the players. He was capable of telling off anyone, even a maniac like Oliver Kahn, bowed down to him like a newborn puppy being recommended <laughs> for munching down on your favorite pair of slippers. Okay, but in relax. fact, over time, relax, he didn't dude, he just... any of that. So much was the respect for him that the players already knew not to mess around when he was watching. After all, with that deep blue stare aimed right at you, it's hard not to feel intimidated. 
But don't get me wrong, Colina wasn't just a mindless tough guy of any sort. He was a diplomat. Mm. The players loved to chat around with him and on the toughest of moments, he was even capable of showing off his more tender side, <laughs> helping out the players whenever they needed. He'd give them a little smooch on the cheek if they made a big goal. <laughs> this guy, this guy is really fucking uh, talking him up. He's riding, dude. Needed. He really was the best of. He made them girls, food. <laughs> how did he get there? As you might imagine, Colina wasn't actively looking for this job. Despite his passion for basketball, just like many other referees, he was trying to make it as a football player first. But Colina was realistic. He knew that the chances were slim, especially as he never found himself to be the most talented. At first, he just made sure to cover his bases, continually working hard in school, where he actually got taught by nuns. And then, he even took a step back. Quite literally, actually. Okay. He began playing as a center back as he found he had the best chances of making it in that position since not many kids <coughs> are willing to play there and it requires a different set of skills. But have you ever asked yourself what team a referee supports or if they're even allowed to? Well, as a teenager, Colina followed two teams, whoever Walter Zenga played for and Lazio. Though at first he was a Bologna fan, as he grew up he fell in love. I hmm. Nicely, I don't care. <laughs> I don't. I don't care. I don't care. I'm not interested. Uh, I don't want to know about the childhood of this referee, uh, especially if it's long. I, I I'm kind of interested in stories of players like. Here, let me skip. Let me skip here. How the players will act before they do. It was with this philosophy that he helped UEFA reduce the number of yellow cards shown in their tournaments. In a way, he set the foundation for modern refereeing. But Chad. back to the 1999 UCL final, this match left a mark on everyone. Easily one of the most dramatic UCL finals of all time. Bayern faced United and five minutes in, Bayern were in front. The lead lasted all the way to injury time, but then, somehow, United struck twice in quick succession, snatching the trophy from Bayern when they were convinced it was already theirs. Get fucked! If the shears from United players were what marked most people, Colina had to deal with both sides of the match. As he told it himself, the United players were running like madmen all over the pitch, but then I turned around and found that most Bayern players were crying and laying down on the floor, hopeless. I saw Samuel Kufur completely distraught. I went up to him and I couldn't think of what to say besides... Still not over that? How old are you, bro? You're not over this from 1999? This was a pivotal moment? This... How old could you have been when this happened? Get up and keep fighting. There's still 20 seconds left on the clock. Football is a cruel sport. Its unpredictability makes it seem like at times it takes away what was already yours. Kufur feels exactly that way. After all these years, he's all right, I, 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 don't, I, you know what? I'm just not into football enough to, to and I want to give this the respect it deserves, uh, which I can't do right now. So, some other video. Uh, football. The public toll road with no speed limit. Biggest win in football history. That's followed up with more football it's stuff. Now been we watched that. John Boys is a great video. Um, insurance cost of superhero disasters. That's kind of interesting. Um, what is this? Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. Smarter Every Day? That seems appropriate. There's a Paralympic scandal? Hmm. Hmm. How increasing prices are shrinking the music in. You're banned for life. <laughs> Get out of here, bozo! Uh, do you need a video we can get smarter to? I don't know if you guys know that, though. 
Need a video that can really bring us that raw intelligence that we're all craving. Super short but informative video about China and democracy. This feels like bait. This feels like bait. I'm going to ban you if it's if it's not what you said it is. I want you to know that. I from now on I will do it. <laughs> Interesting. What is this? It's not what you said it was, but it's not. But you just assured me that I could speak. Sit down inside the car. We're not assuring anything. We're under arrest. Look, I'm under what? Gentlemen, this is Democracy Manifest. Have a look at the headlock here. Okay, See that chap over there? Okay. Get your hand off my penis! <laughs> this is the bloke who got me on the penis before. <laughs> Why did you do this? <laughs> For what reason? What is the charge? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese meal? <laughs> Chad, what a fucking Chad, dude. Apparently, he was wrongfully arrested. He was arrested by mistake. They were looking for a different guy who dined and dashed and looked similar. So it was just an old guy who got manhandled by cops on false charges. <laughs> <laughs> a succulent Chinese meal. <laughs> that rules, dude. All right. Definitely not better than that guy. 15 minute video on Chinese electric vehicles. No, I don't care about that. Um,. Product displacement? What is this? You know what one of my all-time favorite? Uh, no. What is this? Um. I'm a night stalking, crime fighting vigilant. What makes Lego Batman the most faithful Batman? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I just... <laughs> Maybe it's true, but I, I don't care, I guess. Monte, I don't feel anything emotionally <laughs> except for rage. Everyone knows who Batman is. It has a lot is, of viewers, Prior though. to 2017, the vast majority of DC Comics Batverse was still waiting to be faithfully translated to the silver screen. Then the Lego Batman movie happened. It could have been a glorified toy commercial, but in what came was, as a delightful right? surprise to pretty much everyone, it turned out to be the ultimate cinematic love letter to the Dark Knight and one of the most faithful Batman adaptations ever. I've seen you go through similar phases in 2016 and 2012 and 2008 and 2005 and 1997 and 1995 and 1992 and 1989. And before we take this topic apart brick by brick, why not take a moment to subscribe to the Nerdstalgic channel? By the early 1980s, the general public mostly associated Batman with the campy 1966 Adam West TV show. A darker, grittier version of the character managed to fight his way onto the screens in the 1989 movie. I haven't seen this video and I haven't seen Lego Batman. Simply titled Batman, directed by Tim Burton. Ever since then, film audiences have been treated almost exclusively to increasingly dark, serious, and realistic takes on the caped crusader. The Lego Batman, who appeared in 2014's Lego Movie, and who was modeled on the Batman from Burton's movie, was a great satire of these black, body-armored, gravelly-voiced movie Batman. Emmett, this is my boyfriend, Batman. 
I'm Batman. <laughs> His role in the original Lego movie was to be a romantic rival for the protagonist, Emmett. But along the way, Batman was featured in some of the film's most memorable bits and became something of a breakout character. If anybody has black parts, I need them, okay? I only work in black. And sometimes very, very dark gray. Still, it wasn't obvious that he had a tale of his own worth telling, much less one that demanded a spin-off. Batman Returns is the best Batman film full stop. Is that the one with Mr. Freeze as Arnold Schwarzenegger? Or Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze? Is that the one with... Uh... That's Batman and Robin? That's the best one. <laughs> Ice to meet you, Batman. The Iceman cometh. I'm afraid that my condition has left me cold to your pleas of mercy. <laughs> Everything freezes. You are not sending me to the cooler. What killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> the Ice Age! <laughs> coming in the icy cold of space. At 30,000 feet, your heart will freeze and beat no more. After you're frozen, the icy tomb will plummet back to Gotham. Freeze well. Stay cool, bird boy. Can you be cold, Batman? My passion is lost on my pride alone. All right, everyone. Chill. 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 It doesn't work on a cold hearted. Cool party. It's a cold town. Allow me to break the ice. My name is Freeze. Learn it well. How the fuck did he not get the Oscar for this? We've been asking. How the fuck did they not give Arnold the Oscar for this? He sells this character. Ice. The blood will freeze in my hands. I will turn Gotham into an icy graveyard. <laughs> then I will pull Batman's heart from his body and feel it freeze in my hands. <laughs> it's revenge. It's a dish best of cold. Tonight, <laughs> hell breathes over. Let's kick some ice. Tonight's forecast, a freeze is coming. What's funny is that like that's all of his dialogue in the movie. He's he only shows up to say a couple lines of God. All he says are ice puns. Uh so that's the best Batman movie. I don't know why you guys are talking about this one. Off. So when the Lego Batman movie was announced, fans understandably suspected a cash grab. It would be the feature directorial debut of Chris McKay, who had worn a number of hats on the Lego movie, but was still greatly an unknown commodity to the public. Turns out, McKay knew what he was doing. From a world building perspective, Lego Batman instantly realizes what is by far the most expansive version of the Batverse ever to make it onto the big screen. Sure, it all doubles as commercials for Lego figures <laughs> and playsets, but yeah, everything happens in a way that supports the story and character <laughs> journeys. The film only takes minutes to establish all of Gotham City, Wayne Manor, the Batcave, the Batmobile, the Bat Signal, and. Okay, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, how this high school turned into it. You guys have posted that too many times. I think we already watched it. Video on the creation of Nebula by one of the owners. Okay, I'm interested. Oh, it's too long. I remember exactly. Nebula is a $150 million streaming platform? That's crazy. All right, let's watch it. Might, let's get actually smarter for a second. This could be interesting. Where I was. Sydney International Airport, waiting to board a 10 hour flight to Tokyo, followed by a 12 hour flight to Boston, then a one hour one to DC to arrive home the day before Thanksgiving, 2018. My agent Dave said he had an idea he wanted to run past me, so we popped on a call. He just talked to Vimeo, the video streaming platform. 
Mm -hmm. They were trying to persuade him to persuade one of his other clients to build a paywalled streaming site for their videos using their tech. This, and infinite minor variations of this, was something we'd get pitched constantly as creators, but everyone recognized that it couldn't really work. Right. In fact, it had a long history of not working. Perhaps the most flashy failure was Vessel. It launched in early 2015 with the big name creators of the time. Good Mythical Morning, Epic Mealtime, Shane Dawson, Linus Tech Tips. It was basically a YouTube replacement. Same content, same creators, same features, with the addition that users could pay $2.99 a month to watch videos 72 hours early. Combine that with their supposedly unique advertising ecosystem, okay. and the pitch to creators was that they could earn dramatically more per view. This is always the core proposition with these alternate streaming services. More revenue per view, but they almost always have Kick. the same problem the number of views is orders of magnitude lower. Platforms have to extract value from the audience somehow, whether through a paywall or through more intrusive advertising. So why would a viewer watch on your platform when they could watch the exact same content on YouTube for free and with less intrusive advertising? Yeah. So creators sign on the platforms like Vessel, get menial views compared to YouTube, and before these platforms can grow enough to get to a point where it's worth it for creators beyond an initial test group, they run out of money and shut down. Okay. We had some ideas on how we could fix that. We thought there was a chance that we had identified a magic formula that we were in a uniquely good position to undertake that could make this simple concept work where all others had failed. Okay. Four years later, well, not to brag, but we were right. I'm Nimble interested. Has grown massively. Over 650,000 paying users, 100 staff members, a conservative overall valuation of over $150 million. And incredible. All of that with absolutely zero dollars. Actually incredible. So what they do own 100%. Do? Why were we able to make this simple concept work when all others had failed? Clearly this video is going to be different. I'm not gonna be talking about logistics or geopolitics or infrastructure or another business. I'm talking about my business. So that's why for the first time, I'm here. This was a tricky video to write. I'm trying to use my unique combination of- Wait, position. this is Wendover? Face reveal, holy shit. as an owner of a now sizable business and as a creator to tell an intimate inside story of how you can grow an idea into an enterprise. There are a lot of things that can't be said for- Windover's a team, I see. Okay, this is sick. Countless different stakeholders involved. So what follows is what I believe is the fullest story anyone can tell about the inside operations of a business of this size and nature. But there are, unfortunately, some things I just can't talk about. Sure. It's a long story, but it begins in a very small way. On July 27th, 2016, I got this DM from Philip Detmer of Kurskazak. Hey man, let's get right to it. So me and another big YouTuber might be starting something, but I can't really talk about it yet. We went back and forth for a month trying to schedule a call, then finally we talked. Basically, Philip was going to introduce me to the freelance sponsorship agent he and CGP Grey had been working with for years, and later that might turn into something bigger. That freelance sponsorship agent was Dave Whiskus. That's a name you'll want to remember. It's I'm actually awesome. interested. <laughs> we talked, we promised better rates through a data. I'm not really reacting because I'm actually super interested and I, I want to learn more, so I'm gonna be talking. <laughs> I, like, I forgot I was even streaming, bro. <laughs> I forgot I was even streaming for a second. I'm like I'm like, let me turn this up. Wait, I'm I'm literally interested. Turned out he was actually Right. Some important context. The industry that had arisen around YouTube creators in 2016 was chock full of liars, cheats, and thieves. Pog. It was only over the prior couple of years that people could start to make a living off of YouTube, and seemingly the first people that thought to insert themselves as middlemen were all glorified grifters. Yeah, like the Getting sponsored MCNs. is crucial to going full time on YouTube. AdSense alone rarely cuts it. But at the time, the only deals I could land for my fledgling. Oh, hey, guess what? I'm going to say it right now. Um, I got. Uh, uh, Factor reached out to me and wants to sponsor me again. That's cool. That's cool. That's, I mean, that's really cool. And it's cool because, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but despite being probably one of the smallest creators that signed with Factor, I sold more Factor meals than anyone else. I was at the time back, I don't know, it's probably been passed by now, but I was the number one because I actually liked it and I think my pitch was the most believable. <laughs> I my chat my arch I mean this chat bought more factor meals than anyone like much much bigger streamers that had factor sponsor. Uh I met the CEO at TwitchCon and he's like, "Yeah." <laughs> um uh so that's kind of hype. 
fucking channel were ones that automatically locked me into six months of exclusivity with the agency I booked through without any guarantee they would actually fill video inventory and with undisclosed commissions. Undisclosed commissions in this context means they just told you exactly what you'd get paid, which sounds great in theory, but in practice what it means is that they're selling the slot to the sponsor for one price, then paying you. I actually started Factor because of you lost 40 pounds using the keto meals. Uh, save that for the sponsorship, please. <laughs> Save that chat message for when I do the actual sponsor read on Wednesday of next week. Okay. And say that exact thing again. And then I'll read it out loud because they might watch and it'll be cool to have. So just save that. Hold it. It's good. But give me a, give it to me on Wednesday. Give it to me clean. Add, 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 embellish it a little bit too. You say you lost 40 pounds. Make it 80. You know, make it incredible. Make it, <laughs> make it absurd. Make it 80 pounds. And then say you also gained 20 pounds of muscle. And say, um, yeah, maybe, maybe it's like 200 pounds. I lost 200 pounds, keto meals. I gained a ton of muscle, and now I'm a professional athlete. Say that. Say now I'm I'm on the the you know I'm on the Celtics. <laughs> Do that. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Just you know, add a little spice to it. We want to really sell this story a completely different, lower price and never telling you what the difference was. They'll just decide what they think you'll accept, but you have little leverage to say no because, once again, you're locked into exclusivity. You're only legally allowed to work with them. Oh, and also, contractually, they represented the sponsor, not the creator, so their incentives were to push the price as low as it could go. If you didn't like it and wanted to jump ship, you had to go without sponsorship for six months, which would kill your finances. I've seen hard evidence that this particular agency was taking a 50% undisclosed commission on certain creator sponsorships, so it's no wonder why Dave was able to immediately beat their rates and get sponsors to come back. They might have actually been paying less, but I, the creator, was getting more of it. By chance, Gray and Philip had also introduced Dave to Brian from Real Engineering. We had collaborated on a set of videos that turned out to be big viral hits that launched both of our channels into relevancy, so he was one of my first creator friends. The next one was Joseph from Real Life Lore. I had never met him in person, but we had talked plenty, so I convinced him to fly out to the inaugural VidCon Europe in Amsterdam in April 2017. Part of the reason VidCon was because I had been nagging Dave for months to work with Joseph, whose channel was exploding, and Dave would be there too perfect opportunity for them to meet. Joseph ended up having a nightmare weekend of travel delays, some snowstorm or something. So we didn't end up getting there until the afternoon of the last day, but okay. I introduced everyone and we headed to a bar. We stayed there for hours. Everyone headed off and it capped off an exhilarating weekend. The first time <laughs> any of us had seen a physical manifestation. <laughs> uh, no, I do believe they had a great time, but it's funny to talk about it like my life a movie. It was the craziest fucking weekend. We got fucking, <laughs> this is the picture. And it's for like, you know, like nerdy type long form YouTubers. <laughs> <How to fuck. laughs> it's like these guys make 60 minute videos on why windmills are better than fucking dams or something. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, <laughs> this isn't Drake in the club. Uh, but I had a good time of the industry we had inserted ourselves into. After working in isolation, it was eye-opening to see and talk to so many others doing the same thing as us. And according to Dave, in retrospect, this was the moment when he fully realized that this informal system of freelance sponsorship booking could grow into something more. It'd be called Standard, a purposely forgettable name for a company designed to exist in the background, making life easier for the creators on center stage. And it worked. Creators were simply just having a better experience working with Standard. The rates were strong, the experience was personal, the ethos ethical. Is that the fucking... ...easier for the creators on center stage. Give these! Worked. Creators were simply... Is that... Um, Max from Carrot? Uh... Just having a better oh, experience working with Standard. Uh, wait, the thank you strong, very much. The experience was personal. The e what? 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 Wait, what a what a damas. How do I say your name? What da what a What the fuck is your name? Thank you for the twenty gifted. Holy shit. Uh. Oh, what a damas. You're the you are the hero that lost eighty pounds eating factor. <laughs> no, you. You're just embellishing. Uh, interesting. Okay. 
ethos ethical, in a landscape filled with grifters and cheats, the concept of a sponsorship agency simply doing its job fairly was enough to drive natural word of mouth growth. We added dozens of creators to the roster and started to be viewed as the go-to agency for educational YouTube. We hired staff, got an office, started throwing VidCon parties. It was all happening. Unbelievably, this part, the part that at the time felt like hard-earned yet incredible success, needs to get glossed over to get to the good part. November 27th, 2018. After okay. a couple of days of back and forth with myself and a few other creators, that's when Dave emailed his full roster of creators, the white paper. The initial concept laying out our vision for Nebula. This is that exact email. In some ways it was close. How would this work? Standard creators post ad and sponsor-free versions of their videos, and occasionally the service premieres exclusive content. Let's say we charge users $5 per month for their service. All of this is still true to this day, even the price. In other ways, we were way off. How do we attract viewers? First, we can simply buy AdSense ads on standard channels. Sponsoring our own creators feels wrong, at least for now. We can revisit it later if we think we can do it without looking dumb. Okay. This is about as wrong as it could be. We have never figured out how to make AdSense marketing for Nebula profitable, while sponsoring YouTube creators has been the driving growth force. We'll get to how we made that work. Yeah, but the real that key sense. that we understood from day one was that opportunity cost to standard, but especially to creators, had to be as small as it yeah. could possibly Yeah, creators are lazy, and they don't want to change things. Us always raised a huge amount of venture capital funding, made a big splash at launch, and ran out of money before profitability, leaving creators embarrassed when they folded. We knew that creators were wary of aligning themselves to something so risky, so we needed to make a small splash. We needed to design Nebula to fail gracefully. We needed to make it so that if it did fail, it would have the smallest possible impact on reputation That's smart. and finance. That's smart. Essentially, we followed the most dramatic form of the minimum viable product model of innovation. We needed to get a super scrappy version of the product out into the public so that rather than us having to guess, they, the customers, would tell us what they wanted through how they acted. You watch consumer behavior in order to fulfill their wants. Very Luckily, smart. Luckily, a lot of the bones were already in place. Dave's prior life was in the iOS app development world, so he had a lot of experience in software. We actually had a few engineers on staff to work on the backend tool we use for sponsor billing and inventory management. The trickiest bit would be the actual streaming. The big platforms like YouTube and Netflix make it look easy, but it's quite a technical challenge to distribute high quality video on low quality internet all across the globe. Yeah, it makes we didn't sense. possibly have the money to build our own streaming tech. Of course, Vimeo- we'll Just start a uh, online crypto gambling casino. <laughs> Easy. Step one to doing any online streaming for video is to start your own casino so you can make a lot of profit from that and then use that money to do high quality video of the internet. I'm sure that's what Wendover did. I want to cut him off, but like. Originally approached us, but the problem with partnering with them was that they'd have owned the billing relationship. Basically, when someone signed up, Vimeo would keep their credit card details and info, and while we'd get the money, if we ever decided to split with them, there was no guarantee we'd keep the subscribers. So we rather decided to partner with another streaming provider called Zyke. Oh, they Therefore, cut Vimeo out. what we had to build was a front end, a slick, flashy user interface to make it all look professional, and an iOS app. We barely even had a back end. We had Eric, who doubled as our podcast editor, who would take the videos creators added to a shared Dropbox folder, run them through the encoder, and post them in the right spot with the right metadata. All in all, it cost around $100,000 to get Nebula ready for launch. That's low. An incredibly low sum for both a website and app. That's there was awesome. There's still one key thing we were missing. You see, creators don't talk unless they're paid to. This is <laughs> because creators are paid to talk. It's just pragmatic. You basically get one call to action per video. <laughs> Even if you see them in person. <laughs> If you ever see a creator in person, you better pull out your credit card because <laughs> they'll have a little thing you can swipe. And that's per word, by the way. Okay? Never say a single word to a creator. One time I tried to talk to a Spectacore. I was in uh, Toronto for a meeting. I tried to talk to him, and he literally <laughs> charged me. He charged me. And I had to pay him a Canadian funny money, which was the worst part. Uh... Hey, truck. Happy Saturday. Hope you and Ari have a great Saturday and your day tomorrow as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Madge, the check bounced. Yeah. All I did, you know what I did? I took a piece of paper out and I wrote fucking, uh, <laughs> I drew a maple leaf on it and I handed it to him. Said it's worth a thousand fucking toonies. <laughs> and he said, oh, I, finally I made it. I can afford a house. It was crazy. They have no idea. They don't, they don't understand the concept of money up there. Uh, video. 
You're lucky to successfully get someone to listen to one call to action. So what the data shows is that if a creator, for example, runs a sponsor read, then promotes their Patreon, what they'll see on average is that they'll earn less overall than if they had just promoted the sponsor as the Patreon push cuts into performance more than it drives additional revenue. It's not always intuitive, but it's a quirk of audience behavior that we'd understood for years running sponsorships in standard. Therefore, we knew we couldn't just simply ask creators to promote Nebula out of the goodness of their hearts. Not only would this hurt their revenue, which would mean they would stop working with Nebula in the long run, this would hurt Standard's revenue too, since it came from commission on sponsorships. At the right. time, Standard and Nebula were literally the same company with zero legal separation. So weirdly, free promotion for Nebula would cut off the revenue source that we were using to build Nebula. Interesting. We didn't immediately have a solution to this. In all honesty, this was the biggest flaw with the business model at launch. But again, the launch was designed to be an experiment, designed to be that minimum viable product. I mean, that's not that crazy. I mean, I think some of the smartest companies do that, where they have to cannibalize their own current revenue source to build something for the future. It's why I always thought it was really impressive that uh, NVIDIA invested so much into cloud gaming, especially back when NVIDIA was less of an AI company and more of a gaming company. Because like the idea is that eventually, if GFN or, or Xbox or whatever cloud service takes off, People don't buy GPUs because they'll stream it from the cloud. Um, but it's like, uh, you know, the CEO, Jensen was very like open, like someone's going to do this. So we have to be able to make something that can cannibalize our current revenue. It's smart. Uh, or like, you know, um, the way Blockbuster was reluctant to embrace online or Kodak was reluctant to embrace digital cameras because it fucked with their current business model. But if they had just fucking owned themselves, they could have had a huge growth for the future. Mm. Necessarily need a big marketing method at launch because the launch was designed to help us find that. So the last piece that we needed was for the creators to be emotionally invested. Everyone was excited by the concept, but to assure people would stay excited through the inevitably difficult early days, well, we figured they might as well be financially invested. So through complex financial and legal wizardry, we developed a system where fully difficult early. I know this guy. This guy right here. I went and saw, I saw Avatar The Way of the Water with this guy. Hi. <laughs> uh, I don't think, I don't think he works there anymore. I thought he works at Carrot. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to ask him why he's in all these photos. Did he work on Standard or Limited? Days, well, we figured they might as well be financially invested. So, through complex financial and legal wizardry, we developed a system where 50% of Nebula profits were distributed Brain to creators, the 14 months. including, crucially, if the platform were ever to be sold. That means if one day the platform were to sell for, let's say a billion dollars, the creators would get half of that. We split that pool based on watch time, meaning the more creators bring in and engage an audience, the bigger a share they're entitled to. In the short term, this would be a concept that would keep creators building for the future. In the medium term, this would allocate profit to creators based on how much they contributed to growing that profit. And in the long term, if Nebula were ever to sell, this would make that a scenario That's where pretty crazy. Wins, rather than one where the platform wins off the hard work of creators. Not only would That's crazy, really. Uh Damn, that's crazy. That's like <laughs> If you mentioned anything like this to Twitch, they'd fucking shoot you in the leg. <laughs> <laughs> and that's if they're feeling generous. That's so crazy to even think about any type of like ownership of the growth of the whole platform to the creators getting any kind of profit upside is 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 absurd. <sighs> Would this directly tie platform success to creator success and vice versa? It would also keep everyone in that collaborative mindset, one where Nebula and its creators were business partners rather than clients and servicers. We win together and we lose together. Next, launch. We didn't have some massive plan. The website had been up and running for a bit as we squashed bugs, so what really marked the formal launch, if anything did, was the first public promotion. I mean, Twitch never, never had that, but I do think the best days of Twitch, like, the era where there was like that bleed purple and everything, you know, early 2014 ish Twitch, there was definitely a sense that like the, I remember this being the, the ethos or whatever was that like our clients or like our target or our audience is not the viewers. Our target is creators. Everything we build at Twitch was to be better for creators and then they'll deal with the viewers. Like they'll figure that out. And I think that that definitely changed. Uh, 
not immediately post Amazon, but pretty soon after, where it was like the goal was to like find a way to, um, everything was focused on viewers and focused on monetization. Um, Not the platform. Mods? Wait, wait, wait. For what? Uh, so what happened? What do you mean? Did I ban him? Was there somebody weird? I, I, I Do we have a mod or what? I, I don't see anybody. All right, got it. Cool. That came from Isaac Arthur. On the morning of Thursday, May 23rd, 2019, he released a video called Colonizing Black Holes, which ended with a push to his Nebula original, one of the first three called the Paperclip Maximizer. We also had originals that launched uh, from Real Life Lore, Second Thought, and Polyphonic, so we each released videos mentioning Nebula funded by a small and finite pool of money dedicated to launch promotion. This first weekend went better than we possibly could have hoped for. By Monday, we had over 4,500 signups. They were trial signups, plenty would cancel, but okay. that gave us plenty enough data to work with to figure out how to make this all. So what's crazy, okay, so so they released videos that were exclusive to Nebula or timed exclusive? What is that? Better yet, Fully we were getting okay. buzz. A lot of it was negative. <laughs> everyone thought we'd get added to the long list of failed alternate streaming sites. But at the least, this told us that the idea was exciting enough that people cared to care about us. Over the following weeks and months, we used some of our cash on hand to run some very small additional marketing tests. Basically, seeing if we could pay creators a similar rate to their other sponsors and bring in enough subscribers to justify paying that much. The answers we got were promising. On one test we did on my podcast, Extremities, Nebula paid us $800 and got 200 signups, each of whom would pay $5 a month. Nice. The only problem? We didn't have cash. Well, we'd eventually <laughs> generate cash with the monthly revenue these subscribers brought in. That'd be a very slow process, meaning it'd be quite a while until we could start sponsoring the larger YouTube channels. Did they use their YouTube revenue? The originals. But we found a solution. Standard had long run sponsorships for Curiosity Stream, another streaming service focused on documentary and nonfiction content founded by John Hendricks of the Discovery Channel. To their credit, they didn't get scared thinking creators were trying to replace them but rather understood that we were appealing to a different complementary market. Okay. So Dave went down to the offices just outside of DC and came out the other end with a win-win. We'd bundle. While I can't discuss the exact oh. behind the scenes mechanics, we found a way to make it worthwhile for both companies so that when customers signed up for Curiosity Stream through each creator's sponsorship links, they'd get access to Nebula for free. Interesting. Nobody could really see a downside, so we negotiated details, signed a term sheet, and as of September 2019, every Nebula creator just started promoting the bundle in their already booked Curiosity Stream spots. In retrospect, it seems like a minor, ultimately easy change, but it yielded massive. I mean, this is just really cool. I'm, I'm just, I'm impressed. I'm impressed to see creators like uh, uh, moving up the value chain in business. Results. Personally, the bundle deal supercharged my sponsorship performance. It was clear that the offering of Curiosity Stream and Nebula together was a more convincing sell to our audiences than any other sponsor we ran on the channel. Even better, we started to understand the marketing message that worked. Pushing to behind the scenes videos or extended cuts didn't really yeah, work. Yeah, nobody cares. Pushing the idea of no ads or sponsorship on Nebula works okay. But the thing that clearly created these performance multiples was full length, high budget, exclusive originals. Seeing that, Curiosity should- I mean, that I think like, for example, um, I think plenty of people here uh, pay for the Yards Patreon. And one thing I think they figured out more than other people was um, those, you know, they do these dumb little extra shows like uh, watching the, the, the decom and everything. But uh, that's really smart. <laughs> Even small little bits of extra purely exclusive content. I mean, their, their Patreon sells more than almost any other. I mean, podcasts much bigger than theirs in viewership have less money. Um. And I don't think they're the first person to ever do it, but I think they p packaged the right things in the right way. And it was smart. It was smart. Uh, it, it creates a, the user's much more likely to subscribe if there's exclusive content. Stream started to co-produce Nebula Originals with us. In October 2019, to film our highest budget, most ambitious one to date, I flew all the way to the remote Atlantic island of St. Helena to make the world's most useful airport. While I was there, we crossed 10,000 paying subscribers, and it took less than a month more to hit 20,000. By the end of the year, we had crossed 35,000, and in six short months, Nebula had transformed from an idea into a fast-growth startup. 
Now, for all this history, I was not actually an owner of Standard just a highly involved long-term client. But it was clearly something I was interested in. I was there from the start, I had helped it grow, and I believed oh, in he it wasn't an owner. Okay. Nebula's future. In 2020, an opportunity arose. Gray and Philip were less keen on Nebula. It seemed to make less sense to them, while the rest of the creator roster was, so they were looking for a way to end their involvement with the company. Oh, Therefore, interesting. Brian from Real Engineering, Alex from Low Spec Gamer, Devin from Legal Eagle, Thomas Frank, and myself agreed to purchase their ownership stakes and divide it up amongst ourselves. Oh, and wow. we were all extremely bullish on Nebula. By chance, that sale occurred in March 2020, the same month as the world's descent into... That's incredibly lucky. <laughs> That's, I, feel, I feel almost bad for Kurzgesagt or whatever, dude. They sold it to low, and then fucking a global pandemic comes out and all this shit starts mooning. Uh, is there a chance that Wendover created and released COVID to increase the likelihood that Nebula got adoption? I'm not saying it happened. I'm saying, is there a chance? The chance is not zero, right? I'm not, I'm not saying it was a pandemic. Lockdown. With everyone stuck at home, the streaming industry exploded. Concerning. It's awkward to talk about in the context of a tragedy. The honest truth is that our bundle promotion was selling faster than ever, and creators were earning a lot. CuriosityStream capitalized on industry momentum by listing on NASDAQ through a SPAC merger in October, which was initially a big success. Day one ended with an 11% gain, and they peaked in February 2021 at nearly double their first day price. Through and through, the Nebula bundle was a win. I mean, all SPAC. I don't know if any SPAC is is doing well. <laughs> uh, pretty much all of them are down. Is this? I, I wouldn't trust this. Man, it grew Nebula. Uh, it grew Curiosity Stream. It grew Creator Sponsor Payouts, and it was a worthwhile proposition for all. So we decided to double down on aligning the success of the two companies by, for the first time ever, accepting investment. Now, investment had long been something we were wary. In our view, a big reason why similar business models had failed in the past was because investors pressured the streaming platforms to squeeze more and more value out of the creators. <laughs> Basically, they did the thing... Sorry, say that again. <laughs> Sorry. All right, just one more time for the, for the people in the back platforms to squeeze more and more value out of creators. Basically, they did the thing that seemed right when you looked at it on a slide deck. Take a bigger share of the revenue, make more money. But that fails to understand that the creators drive almost all of the value of a platform like Nebula. If they're making good money, they'll make more exclusive content for audiences, they'll bring their creator friends in, they'll keep promoting the platform. So it's really that if you take a smaller slice of the pie and give more to creators, the pie will grow so much in the long term that the pie yeah! will make more overall. Every dollar a streaming platform like Nebula yeah! makes is through the creators, so it's about creating that win-win scenario rather than trying to extract value from your business partners. We weren't confident that most investors, especially institutional investors, would understand that and the other nuanced dynamics of the creator industry in the long run, with one exception, Curiosity Stream. Their people seemed to to what we were already doing. Unlike when we launched Nebula as a whole, we had a good amount of cash on hand to invest in this thanks to Curiosity Stream's investment, so we wanted to launch strong. We built out a section of the website and apps for it, we built the back-end tech to allow for multiple tiers of membership, and we invested a lot in content. We launched with six classes, and each was high quality. Shot in a studio in New York, well edited with motion graphics mm -hmm. and everything. That's to say, they weren't cheap. We then planned to release a new one each week, which meant organizing a dense production schedule. It was a massively complex, large-scale undertaking, but the engineering and production staff made it all happen without a hitch. The Pog. problem was that the concept just wasn't resonating with customers. We initially sold Nebula classes as an additional tier above normal Nebula. It was $100 a year. That's interesting. I, I've, Master class has done quite well, I thought. So maybe these guys aren't just the biggest draws or the or the concept was, or they just Master Class outcompeted them or what? I thought Master Class is doing pretty well um, in sales. I mean, they have Ninja on there for Christ's sake. By itself for a $5 a month upcharge for existing subscribers, which might seem like a lot, but was actually lower than competitors with similar production quality. We ran sponsorships on this and had some minor wins, but on average, there was clearly audience confusion as we also ran bundle sponsorships on the same channels at different times. We couldn't promote classes and bundle sponsorships as classes weren't part of the bundle, so in a way, we were competing against ourselves and losing. 
Some people were upgrading. It wasn't some massive failure, but hardly enough to justify our rate of production. Ultimately, creators could improve sponsorship performance more by making Nebula originals, so that's what they would do. It was also clear that by the time we launched, we were on the downslope of the online classes wave. We were far from the only class platforms. Yeah, everyone did it at the beginning of COVID. <laughs> so ultimately, we decided the best to just have one Nebula. No upcharge for classes. We'd make it available to all subscribers and simply slow down our production calendar. It was an important experiment, and while not a direct overwhelming success. Master class is having relatively tough times. The revenue is nowhere near what they expected growth would look like. Yeah, I mean, yes, exa yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, 2023 is a return to normalization in some of this stuff, and everyone thought the COVID growth would be exponential. Success, in a way, the marketing test we did for it proved crucial for what was to come. Also, like, you got to imagine Masterclass must have spent a fuck ton of money to get the names they get. People like that, you know, they don't do Masterclasses for, <laughs> for cheap. Uh, they got fucking Steph Curry in there, bro. I our biggest, most existential experiment to date. Come late 2022, as indicated in their quarterly reports, CuriosityStream was looking to pull back their growth rate and orient more towards profitability. COVID was dying down, screen time was lowering, the streaming industry overall was weakening, and so it made every sense in the world for them to switch from a growth orientation to a profit orientation, as all growth-oriented companies that survive eventually do. Right. I assume for these reasons, we got word that they wanted to significantly pull back on marketing spend through Nebula bundle sponsorships. Clearly, this wasn't something we wanted. Not only would it slow Nebula's growth rate, but more crucially, it would reduce how much we could pay creators to talk about Nebula on YouTube. This was still the primary way creators were earning through Nebula. While watch time payouts and originals were significant, payouts for YouTube sponsorships about Nebula were far more so. So the natural next question to ask was, could we just do sponsorships ourselves? You'll notice that nearly everything advertised in a sponsorship at the end of a YouTube video is an online subscription-based service. For sure. some reason or another, these are just what works best. And here's how those advertising campaigns work in the back. Or games. Let's say a service costs $10 a month. Every service has data on how long the average subscriber- Although I heard, I heard, I got a friend that works at uh, Genshin Impact. <laughs> I got a hurt and I was talking to him recently and he was telling me that uh, Genshin's been kind of pissed at the performance of- um, ads for their game that are put in the middle of a video. Like people just, people are skipping them so frequently that it's not worth it. So they've upped their bag. You know, they're paying more of a bag, but it has to be a full video. And like no big creator wants to do it. Because <laughs> if you don't have a Genshin based channel, just dropping down a full Genshin video is like, that's a tough ask. That's a tough ask. But if you see someone do it, just know they got the absolute bag for it. By the way, my comeback video on YouTube is Wednesday. It's called <laughs> The H Rock Genshin Story. <laughs> it's a three hour journey into the world of Genshin Impact. Around, let's say it's 27 months. That means the average lifetime value of a sign up is $270. It might actually cost, say, $5 a month to run that service, meaning per month, there's $5 left. A good bit of that has to go to actually getting the customers in the first place, to marketing. Knowing there's $135 left in the average lifetime value, the company will decide on a target average cost per acquisition. Let's say it's $75, leaving $60. <laughs> it's titled Where I've Been. <laughs> you know where I've been? I've been in the magical world of Genshin Impact. so legendary it would be so bad it would be so bad but it would be so legendary it would be so <laughs> it would be so fucking funny but uh I, of course I won't do that but uh, I just think it's it would be so funny 
dollars in lifetime value for profit that can be reinvested in platform growth or just taken as profit. Now that $75 target cost per acquisition acts as the central success metric for marketing, and when an agency designs a campaign with creators pushing the service, their payment will be designed in the background by this number. If, on average, they drive 100 signups per video, their pay will be roughly $7,500 per video, and Sheesh. either the agency or the service itself will evaluate spots as they run to make sure the long-term average cost ends up at or below $75. This works quite well, but the only issue is when that $75 needs to get paid. Here, right when the customer signs up. But on the company side, after the $5 in monthly operating expenses, it's going to take 15 months for them to capture that $75 back in revenue. You essentially need to spend $75 to eventually earn that $60 in profits. Yeah. Put another way, you need to invest it. This is the role of investors in these startups. Companies can have an entirely viable business model, but just need more cash in the bank to pay for the marketing. Here's what I'll do. I'm gonna give you the 200,000 up front as debt and then you give me a royalty on every subscription sold to nebula of two dollars until i get my money back and then three dollars in perpetuity after that <laughs> do we have a deal <laughs> that leads to growth. But we didn't want to take more investments. We didn't want to give up more ownership of the company. So the question was, could we use the couple million we had in the bank to kickstart growth at a fast enough rate? We were sure we had a viable business model. We had years of proof that we could get a customer through YouTube sponsorship for less than their average lifetime value. The question was when that cost per acquisition was recaptured. If it was quick, in the first year or so, we were in business. The math worked out that we could maintain or even grow our monthly marketing spend as we would recapture revenue fast enough to reinvest it in new marketing. If it was slower, if we didn't recapture target. I kind of want to watch a uh, in-depth intellectual series called China Actually. Maybe I'll subscribe to Nebula and check it out. This is not an ad. <laughs> I wish they were paying me for this. Pay me for this. Cost uh, per acquisition until By the way, this whole thing is an ad. I mean, this video is an ad. <laughs> Fuck, I just watched a 28 minute ad for free? Shit! Oh, I got played so hard! Future, the careful balance that had made Nebula work or so many close equivalents failed could all come crumbling down. Today we're five months on from this. I would do marketing Mondays on Nebula. Fuck, dude. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh. <laughs> Let me fucking talk. Uh. Switched to direct marketing and I won't bring the lead. It went off better than our wildest expectations. Crucially, over 80% of signups are opting to pay for the annual subscription rather than the monthly one. Considering we pay creators for Nebula sponsorships the day after they go out, that means we actually get a year's worth of revenue before we even pay for the promotion. In this case, that entirely eliminated the cash flow constraint because we make more day one on an average signup than our average cost to acquire a new customer. Of course, that doesn't mean we turn a day one profit, we have operating costs beyond marketing, but it means we have a marketing strategy that could theoretically expand basically infinitely zero cash flow limitations. In just a few short months, we went from spending zero dollars to more than half a million dollars on marketing per month, and we are earning back more than that in the same Sheesh. month. I can't stress enough how incredible this is. We, the creators, are now entirely in control of our own. That's a lot. Just, I mean, to give, uh, you know, obviously the big guys have multiple millions, you know, uh, they, they have tens of millions, hundreds of millions, like Coca-Cola or whatever, but for example, NVIDIA's entire marketing budget, I'm gonna get I have a rough estimate. I'm not, I shouldn't be saying exact numbers. But the entire marketing budget for like the launch of the 20 series, right? The 2080 was, let's say around 500K. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that, 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 that's, it wasn't big. It It wasn't big, it wasn't.
Uh, my mom just walked in and said, you wear the Enron hat because of that guy? And then you said, yes. <laughs> Giga Chad. Uh, Giga Chad. Tell her less chatter and leave the Dino Nuggies by the door, okay? Um. Future. With this, we're charting our most ambitious slate of originals to date. We're bringing in new creators. We're investing in our tech. There is so, so much that this big risk has unlocked. Right now, it feels like the last couple of years have been an overwhelming success. But I truly believe that. Looking back, we'll consider 2023 much like we see 2019. The turning point that makes previous success the backstory you just have to get through to get to the good part. We have learned so much. So now we understand what people want and we have a company configured to offer that. That's cool. I truly cannot wait to show you what we can do. Now I need to do thank yous. When describing Nebula's history like- Ah, uh, that's fine. Uh, very cool, very cool video and, and congrats to them. I think that's a, uh, there's a lot of intelligence there. That's really cool. Um, I'm gonna check out Nebula for sure. Not an ad. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the stream. I'm sorry I, I kind of abruptly hit you, but I, I, again, I've been on a quest to be as consistent as I can with sleep schedule. Uh, here's the deal. I will not be live tomorrow. I will not be live. I will be working on my video for Monday. Um, I may not even be live Monday. We'll see. We'll see. I hope to be, but I will not be live on Sunday for sure. Um, but hopefully we have YouTube for next week. That's all I'm working on right now. So thanks. Uh, appreciate all the support. Appreciate all the subs today. I really, really sincerely do. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, much love sevens. Wish you all well. Have a great rest of your weekend. How about you take Sunday and actually finish some of the things you've been putting off. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you got shit due Monday. I'm sure you have, maybe you have work ahead and you could get a little preparation on Sunday. Why don't you take a fucking, why don't you do something on Sunday so you don't feel so stressed on Monday, huh? How about that? Just give it a try, dude. Fucking nopers I won't. <laughs> Just finish some task, dude. You'll feel good. Do one. All right. Appreciate you. Sincerely, have a great night. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'm going to raid the Spectacore live. I'm trying to get him to fucking run some more. Hit, man. Oh, bro, a spectacle. I gotta tell you. <laughs> Wait, is he still here? Are you here? Do you remember when I was running and I had that crazy pace of like a day or maybe two days ago? And then I died. Oh, it was, it was yesterday. It was yesterday. It was Friday. I had an absolutely legendary pace and then I died and I left to go with magic. Well, when I came back, I finished out that run. <sighs> You're so lucky. You're so lucky I died on that exact level. That was the best RNG ever. I finished out that run at like 30 minutes, 30 fucking 67 or something. It was absurd. It was, abs it was, um, it was like, there was like a bunch of twos. Um, there was like a three target Haven. That was like 30 seconds. It was disgusting. It was disgusting. It was the best RNG I've ever seen. I was, oh my God. Uh, anyway. Uh, you know, I died, so it doesn't count. But man, had had I finished that out and just not choked it on scale, that would have been an untouchable record. I could just, that was, I've never got any RNG close to that. Uh, all right. Anyway, peace. Good luck. Watch Spectacore tomorrow. He's going to run like crazy. It'll be fun.